Hello and welcome to episode 123 of the Crate and Crowbar. It is the, what day is it? 14th of 14th December. 14th of December <laughs> 2015 and this is our last episode of the year. My name is Chris Thurston and I'm joined by Graham Smith. Hello. Marsh Davies. Hello. Tom Senior. Hello. And Tom Francis. Hello. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you may notice something slightly different about uh, the, the video we've uploaded to this episode in that it is a video and not just a picture of a box. <laughs> Which has been our traditional approach. Yeah. So we are here, li- not live, pre-recorded from Tom Francis' <laughs> living room to talk for X amount of time about 2015 in computer games. The best ones. The best, the best, the best ones, yeah. Like, we should, we should note that we're all being played by actors for this particular <laughs> yeah. episode of the podcast, we, so um, I hope the performances are excellent and do us justice. We managed to find five identical beards. <laughs> And Tom. This is in Tom's <laughs> house. This is a set. It's nothing. None of it is real. Anyway, it's all lies. Anyway, what isn't lies is our opinions on computer games Which from this true. year that we're going to have. So we're going to diverge from the traditional format somewhat uh, and just talk about a the, massive list. A massive list. <laughs> so we were planning to get all of us to choose a game of the year and maybe a couple of runners up and then go through them one by one, person by person. However, that's uh, we didn't. <laughs> so instead of doing that what we're going to do is go through the entire long list of games that we all liked and by the end of the episode we'll maybe, definitely have an idea definitely we will have each chosen a game to give a meaningless accolade <laughs> to we'll see you in five hours <laughs> yeah. approximately uh, what are we drinking Tom I feel like we should explain everything we're doing because they yeah. can see us now these are vanilla peach old fashions good god they're uh, very nice. Made with vanilla sugar, which is sh- vanilla and sugar in a blender, and peach bitters, and unexpectedly good. Yeah, that's good really <laughs> yes, nice. you're supposed to use orange old, orange bitters, but uh, apparently peach works. You have to drink on YouTube, buddy. <laughs> I assume so. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's my drunk kitchen, which is like... right. Yeah, you can't drink on Twitch. That's what I'm thinking. Really? Of. Really? Uh, yeah, you can't. I don't. You're not. Well, you can drink. What, you're not meant to be drunk on Twitch. Hmm. It's a, interesting. They're weird really sanctimonious in some ways. Yeah, given the things that they permit in chat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, if anyone asks any questions, it's iced tea and very <laughs> tasty, sharp it's as as iced tea. tea the drink. And Daddy's a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Marty is going to lead us down the long list that we assembled not <laughs> thirty seconds ago, and is written in pencil. <laughs> Mugsver. How Mugsver. do people feel about Mugsver, otherwise known as Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain? It's good. <laughs> I like it. Next. Just, just in case it was going to pass over in silence. <laughs> it's really good. It's, uh, I don't know if it's my game of the year yet. Or we'll find out at the end of the podcast. <laughs> it, well, um, I think it, I enjoyed it probably uh, more in, at points than any other game of the year, but then there were huge parts of it that I really intensely hate. Yeah. Um, and I, I didn't finish it either, so I, didn't, me, I kind of feel guilty picking it. There are... Um, the vast majority of that I really loved, of my time with it, which was, you know, like 40 hours or something, and about four of those hours were spent in the kind of bullshitty scripted missions where things were happening beyond my control and I wasn't given any ability to foresee or plan around the mm. uh, things. And then there's just awful scripted sequences and then obviously the story itself, everything I saw of it, I hated. <laughs> Not that I gave it a chance. I was skipping cutscenes right from the start. But I was still surprised at how much of it was just let me be in the open world and just let me tackle things with my own cord. Obviously, you're going to get to decide that yourself by whether you take on the main missions or the side missions. But even within the main missions, like, probably seven out of ten of them were just open-ended, really cool things. There were some, there were even some that kind of had scripting in them, but the scripting was really, like, um, sophisticatedly done, like, really uh, well thought through and could adapt to everything you did with it. One where... Um, your target is going to visit a series of prisoners around in like three different camps across the open world and do three different interrogations. Oh, yeah. And one of them is is your target, but you can't find out. You don't know where any of them are to begin with, so you have to tail the interrogator uh, to find all three and scope out all three, and then when you see the right one, it will be flagged up as the right one and you can rescue them. And it's not like... It's randomised rather than pre-scripted which one it is, so it could be the first one you see, I think. Um, And also, all of them still exist out in the open world before you even start and not only that but they are the wrong locations for the interrogations so while it's all, this is all going on you're tailing the guy they're being driven to their respective locations 
So you can happen across them just being driven along the road and just like spy them and go, oh, hang on, that's my target. And then just run in and take it. Um, and that was, I did that like four or five times and everything I tried to put a spanner in the works, it just adapted seamlessly and just everything made perfect sense. And uh, some of those playthroughs were like uh, the wrong ones and ended up being like impossible or frustrating, but other ones were, uh, you know, felt great to kind of refine a strategy, but then also cope with the randomness of it. And it was weird to see because in the same game, the things I hate are scripted missions where they scripted things just to, it has to unfold this way because this is the plot, you know, these, mm. at this point, these people show up and they scupper your mission in this way. And at the, when the cutscene ends, you're in front of all these people. So if you want to just stealth approach, mm. fuck you, too late. And yet in the same game, they have these amazingly, like, flexible scripted systems that feel like you would, I expect to only see that in a game where the developers have decided ahead of time, like, we have to respect what the player wants to do and we'll never, you know, take control away from him, we'll never, um, determine what kind of play style he wants to do but this game just has all types of all things <laughs> <laughs> it feels like at times like there is a a way that the game wants you to play it or a preferred way to do certain missions like uh, it has these resource systems in the meta game where you're building up your oil rig army and it has uh, scoring at the end of missions which is quite good at favouring whether you want to play lethally or not but it's still like the resource thing incentivizes going in close to mission objectives because then you can stick balloons on <laughs> more stuff and steal them for your base back home. But because they're using that to incentivize you, it seems like like there are missions where the two guys are meeting up inside a building and then they're going to walk off to a helicopter and you know there's an incentive to sneak in there and make your way past two dozen guards take them out silently or kidnap them or whatever but you can also just go to a nearby hill and shoot a rocket launcher <laughs> from like 300 yards away that just blows up both of them and then just run away and the mission success the game's completely okay with that yeah even in the more scripted bits, I mean, the, specifically, the, the bullshit stuff is with those kind of ghost commando yeah, things. Oh, yeah. The skulls. The, the skulls. Mm. Whenever they show up, it's just, the game goes to shit immediately. Like, it immediately becomes really bad. Um, but whenever that's not happening, it's it's amazing how fluid it is. Even in supposedly scripted missions, like, you, you could do something else, like get some get to a guy before I was supposed to, and, uh, you know, he was supposed to be whisked away to a, a base in a car, but I just knocked everyone out and he never got in the car. <laughs> and it was fine, because the, the mission wanted me to tail him to the base, but instead I interrogated him, and then he told me where the base was. So th th there's always these kind of layers of kind of failure, where the, 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 the scripting will break down, but give you a, a way to continue in a way that feels really natural in the world, which is pretty exceptional. The skulls are total bullshit, but the first, like, three times I encountered them, I just ran away. I just got yeah. my horse oh, yeah. and fucked off. And, yeah. and after a certain distance, the game was just like, all right, you're done with that challenge, I guess. <laughs> and then the first mission, as a result, the first mission that the skulls don't turn up at the end, they turn up partway through, is mm. like a twist reveal, and you actually have to deal with them because you haven't yet extracted mm. your target. Mm. Right. Um, that was then a huge pain in the ass, even more so, because I didn't know, I'd never fought them before, and mm. I was like 30 hours into the game. And so I went, I, someone linked, I think maybe you, Tom, someone on Twitter posting, this mission is bullshit, here's a YouTube video for how to yeah. do it. Um, and it's basically just a particular fence that, sorry, if you just climb over that fence, you can just stick a balloon on the truck that you're trying to extract. Yeah. And the skulls still turn up. But because you are so close to the truck at the point where you just climb over this fence, that you know you just get it out and then you just climb back over that fence. <laughs> no way! <laughs> and then just skip it. If that you mission was um, one that I was warned was bullshit, and when I started it, I'm like, I can't because it has a name, so you know it is mm. that mission. And, Traitors um, Caravan, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And I think Andy Kelly had said it was it was fucking awful. And I started it. You got to intercept a convoy, and I was like, five minutes in, I'm like, I'm already having a great time setting up this ambush. I got my horse to shit on the road. I got my horse also <laughs> to stand in the road, and then I parked several cars in the road, and I parked C4 all over the place, and I'm like, this is going to be amazing. <laughs> and the convoy shows up without spoiling anything. It's not amazing, <laughs> and fuck you if you hadn't got a plan. <laughs> and so yeah, I just it was so I didn't even. Uh, let myself get frustrated by repeating it. I just, it was such bullshit that the very first time I'm like, I'm never going to enjoy this. I need to just have someone tell me exactly how you do it. And of course on YouTube, there's like, here's how to get the maximum possible rating on the maximum possible difficulty with all mm -hmm. the, um, all the possible handicaps. And it involves just, I don't even fire a shot. You just run in a straight line at a particular point and pull through the fence and yep, your balloon's there before they, um, in other situations, they'll shoot down the balloon. Sometimes mm. that's the rule. Like you can't alternate. You've got to deal with the threat because otherwise they'll mm. shoot down the Fulton balloon. But then, nope, if you just do it at a certain time, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, because in that situation, they do shoot down the Fulton balloon. I think that's the problem with that mission is it's not so much that it throws the skulls at you, although they are bad. It's that 
it counters your bollocks magical mechanic, <laughs> which is your magical failsafe balloon that steals yeah. things, mm. with their bullshit magic mechanic, which is zomb- leaping zombie men that fly out of places and don't die. So that feels unfair at that point, because you're used to having all of the power and you're used to being able to determine basically what the rules are for who can do what and when. I think you're going to sum up the Metal Gear Solid series in three words. It would be bullshit magical mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> just, uh, that just... Uh, and I was kind of thankful that that took a massive backseat in this game, and it's such a such a strange, strangely different game from every other Metal Gear Solid game. Uh, and it's crazy that you know it actually becomes this open world, beautiful, systemic game when always previously it's been really uh, loads of interesting systems in it, but really, really quite linear. To most there was a surprising number of people who wrote features and reviews about the game that said, "Oh, this is the game Kojima's been trying to make all along." <laughs> and they said, "Really? No, that's not <laughs> true." I don't think. No, I don't think. I think the only way you, form. Yeah. the only way you can argue that is that he went through a sort of process of evolution himself, where he went from literally like because obviously Kojima being into movies is the thing everybody says about Kojima. But the thing about Metal Gear Solid Five is it does produce all these really cinematic moments, but it produces them usually dynamically, mm. and that's so. If you argue that it is still a big action movie of a thing, but they've managed to engineer lots of ways to make the player in charge of the nature of that film and the kind of spectacle that follows, then I think you can argue that it's an evolution of what he's done before. Mm. But, but also, nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess it's kind of incomplete on PC at the moment because the on- online component isn't out until. January, January I, think, yeah. I think. So that's going to be a whole thing. Isn't it? Is that already out on consoles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can wear a kitten on your head and kill people. Yeah. <laughs> so it could get. I better. saw trailers for it that look quite interesting. Yeah. Konami going to support that though? <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> I can shrug now. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a tiny percentage of our listeners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tom so, shrugs. <laughs> are we done with Metal Gear Solid then? It's good, and I like it. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. How about Invisiblink? Invisiblink. Yeah. Man, we're getting through all of my favourites. Because <laughs> that's my other contender for Game of the Year. And it's definitely one of those two, but I haven't decided which yet. This this, this list is in the order that we thought of them. In. Yeah, so I guess maybe it's indicative of the ones that yeah. we like most. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's fucking great. <laughs> I've played it before this year because mm. it was in the IGF and I was judging it. Usually, it was only early access, so like anyone could play it at that point. Um, and usually I stay away from it, but because it was in the IGF, I played it at an early stage. And uh, so I did a playthrough of it quite recently. It's sort of like a rare game where I played it before release, at release, and since release. Um, and I was still discovering loads of new things about how the balancing works and what items are available. Actually, they kind of patched it recently, so that, that was um, uh, all new as well. And I feel like I've had sort of three games worth of, of great experiences with it. You know, each campaign is about eight hours and I certainly played through, I think, twice before release, and then I think once or twice at release, and then once recently with a new DLC. And every time, um, it's been this... Not every campaign I've started, but every campaign I've continued with has been like a brilliantly gripping thing all the way through, and I've got so excited about it. And the thing it has over Metal Gear, like both of them, despite being incredibly different in terms of like presentation and uh, format and stuff, it's turn-based, isometric um, strategy game about stealth. It's still kind of, I feel like it ticks a lot of the same boxes in terms of letting me play how I want and set up strategies and plan ahead and watch guard patrols and say, okay, I'm going to deal with this in this way. But the thing that Invisible Ink has um, over Metal Gear for me is that, um, one of them, is that it's the way you build your team by buying equipment, uh, upgrading your hacking AI, um, installing cybernetic implants and leveling up their skills... All those systems tie into each other really, really well. They're all really well thought through. The upgrades you can get are just sort of massively exciting. <laughs> I can't think of another game where, like, when I go, when I go to a shop in Invisible Ink, like, uh, very rarely uh, if I'm far into the game and I've got loads of good stuff, it won't have anything that's massively exciting to me. But most of the time, particularly early on, you go to a shop and you're just like, oh my god, <laughs> I can't believe that's like a dart gun that goes through two layers of armour and it replenishes every mission but it's 1,200 and I'm going to have to sell my cat to do this <laughs> and uh, even once you kind of do have some decent equipment sometimes you like, you go to a shop and you realise oh fuck well, like, we've already got a buster chip that can hack a device for free if we get there in person and that's on sale here and so in another game that I'd be like oh well you can't have two because it's some special bullshit rule but invisibly like, no if you've got two then you can just do that twice. And they've got cooldowns of like four turns each, but they're separate. So you can do one and then you can do another. 
and I ended up with a character with like five buster chips. Just a whole inventory was just buster chips. And so you just run up to anything and no matter how absurdly difficult it was to hack, she could do it for free, basically. And then by the time we need to do that again, at least one of them would be recharged. And for most of the game, you don't need anything like that. I wouldn't use them on most missions because I already had a pretty good hacking setup as well. And then right uh, on a sort of critical mission, they sometimes throw in like total curveballs where it's just like, oh, you thought you had armor piercing. Well, this guy needs eight armor piercing. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy who had 12 shields, which means basically 12 armor piercing. So armor piercing, you like, you get one early on and you can maybe level up to like two and then if you stack loads of mods and cybernetic orgs you might get up to like four so piercing more than four layers of armor in the conventional campaign is just absurd but if they're shields you can also hack them like each one is a firewall as well as being a layer of armor so the more you can hack the less armor penetration you need and because I had this one character who just had five buster chips she could just sneak up to this guy and just go (laughs) 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 and he had no armor (laughs) I feel like it's the designer's game on the list. Yeah, and like yeah. Every system it's got feels so tightly wound and so tightly underwoven that there's nothing wasted in the game. It's precision engineered to create these tense little scenarios. Does this amazing thing of being um, a turn-based tactical game with no element of chance in it beyond the initial mm-hmm. run generation of the levels. So you always know where the guard sight lines are. You always know where the cameras are. You always know exactly what all their capabilities are, like what their shields are. Everything is listed for you. And even then, it's an amazing, like consistently interesting challenge, uh, which is extraordinary. I can't think of another game that is like that. Um, yeah. I mean, XCOM is amazing, but it's incredible. All, all of its tension comes from chance. Yeah. yeah. Whereas this is a game that uh, all the tension comes straight from design, and it's all just pure design and, and uh, w- always works. It's It's amazing. This year I've been really interested in games that are that transparent with the player that really don't hide very much from you. It has Fog of War, but it gives you complete control over how and when you get rid of that Fog of War. And 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 also you can see the vision cones of people who you don't know about. So if you can see a square and it says it's clear, it is clear for Mm -hmm. sure. You don't have to worry about anything. Exactly. It feels completely fair. So it allows you to own all your mistakes. And I think that's really crucial. Like coming from a lot of games including something I really like this year that's actually not on the list I think maybe even should be which is Starcraft Legacy of the Void although mm. actually I might, might leave that one off because it's <laughs> Starcraft 2 and everyone knows what that is but uh, you know Starcraft 2 is, is a lot about even in single player or in multiplayer it's about um, an element of chance in that there's a lot of chance involved in not seeing things there's a lot of chance involved in um, missing game elements even though ultimately it's kind of like a deterministic mathematical formula that you're resolving either successfully or unsuccessfully whereas Invisible Ink it still feels like an improvisation even though everything's completely clear mm. because you're always given complete control over what information you get and when and you, as you say you always know exactly what the consequences of an action are going to be when you perform them and that's a, it feels like a magic trick like to make something that precise I love having fewer characters a greater concentration of power mm. which is what I enjoy about things like Dawn of War 2 where they it's not about lots of individual drones that you kind of corral. It's about these individual powerful things that you can direct very with great intention. And that makes your decisions more meaningful because it's not like, I'm going to vaguely move these dudes over there and maybe some of them will be successful, maybe some of them won't. It's like every single action you do is, is it comes straight from you and there's no kind of layer of interpretation there. So there's no people getting stuck on scenery. There's no kind of, you know, this, this form of things isn't going to betray your intention. It's always you've got this one agent and they're going to do the thing you tell them to do and you're, you're playing the game completely directly. There's nothing between you and the consequences of, of, of your decisions. Mm. It's really, really good. So, I was going to say, why aren't more games like that? And I suspect it's because it's hard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've listened to some podcasts with those guys um, talking about the process of designing it, and it, yeah, it was hard. <laughs> it just it sounds like it went through massive revisions of so many times. And actually, it's interesting. I think it did well. I don't know anything about the sales figures or anything, but it's like it's got a great positive rating on on um, on Steam. But there's I talked before about how it, like. The fact that it has a pre-written narrative that has a kind of twist at the end is it clashes badly with the idea that it's a game you replay. And so it gets complaints about it being too short when really it's a game that's like Splunky where you, its length is kind of irrelevant because mm. it's about replaying it. But then there was also a thing where um, a lot of people just really can't get on with it at all because of the alarm system, which is when you start a mission in Invisible Ink, there's an alarm that's just ticking up all the time. There's, there's never... The individual guards don't know you're there but the corporation do. Like, they know that there's someone in the building, and the longer you're in the building, the more security measures they'll bring online. 
and you can some things that you do will increase the alarm rating faster but even if you stay in just a tiny closet and never spot up any guard at all it will just keep going up every single turn you're always it's always getting worse and worse and worse so even though it's time even though it's turn based some people think of it as a game with a time limit that uh, there's just time pressure from the word go and if it was real time like a, you know if it was splinter cell and every mission had a, a real time time limit that would be horrible and I'd hate mm. it and I see that reaction from people in it because they just they feel there's something about it being a stealth game that just tells them well then until I'm detected nothing should be there should be no pressure um, and for me I think it's not that I I actually do have a negative reaction to that instinctively like I do feel stressed out by it and, and I want to say oh you should take that out because then I can strategize and you know, plan or, around things but I also, because I understand why the game works long term, because I've been through it so many times and seen why it needs that pressure, I'm appreciative of like, no, this has to be there. If you take that out, it, it just becomes, your best strategy becomes a really boring one. You have to be pressured to move on and you have to be pressured mm. to kind of... There's an interesting comparison with Metal Gear there, I think. Like, I think one of the problems stealth games face a lot is the moment when you're detected is sort of like the ultimate failure for a lot of players which is where you get saves coming yeah. from in Thief or Deus Ex or whatever mm. because everyone really wants to ghost it and the problem those games traditionally have is how do you get players to keep going with an accident because that's when the interesting things happen is yeah. when it's like I was slightly detected but I got away or, or it went to shit but I managed to improvise a solution and all those systems go to waste if players are like no, no got, you know smelled by a guard I'm out <laughs> like you Invisible Link solves it by basically saying that just by entering the building that initial detection has already taken place. The corporation has detected you coming in. They know you're there somewhere. Go, sort it out. And that's fine. You can still be vulnerable in that scenario, but it basically begins at the point where most people would already have quick-loaded a different stealth game. <laughs> um, in Metal Gear, they just established that you're you're so powerful and you have so many options that getting detected is just a change in the plan, really. As long as it can be part of the plan. So even though there is, you know, if you're going for certain ratings, it's a good idea to try and ace everything and get a perfect stealth playthrough when it doesn't it's not the sort of shutting down of your options to have in other stealth games it's this big expansion so therefore the distinction between the two is a lot lighter than it is in other stealth games anyway you have you know when you get detected in Metal Gear it's suddenly headshot in time or like I don't know panic dog attack time <laughs> or, or the best example of this is when if you have quiet with you in Metal Gear before you get the upgrade that means she's not lethal you have to upgrade her to get her to stop fucking killing people. <laughs> where she will just shoot anybody the moment they see you, mm. regardless of whether you want her to or not. Which adds a really interesting dynamic to that game where it's like, oh, I guess we're killing people now. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving the people you're there to extract or save. <laughs> yeah. hmm. It feels like it's also a triumph of early access. Because mm. I, I mean, it's that thing you just said about it being hard to develop and hearing Clay talk about it and the challenges of that. But I played the... F- just before it got added to early access, when Clay put it out to their own community, so you could buy it through their site, but you couldn't get it through Steam uh, yet, um, and they sent that version out to press, and I didn't think it was very good. <laughs> I, can't, I think I talked about it on the podcast yeah, at the time, and it was, this might be good, but there's only two agents, and it feels kind of hollow, at it, and it's, it's core when it doesn't have that many agents and items, and it's so incredibly difficult as well that I just couldn't get past like the second or third level. Yeah. Um, and the the generation of the levels, I don't think, was the final algorithm they settled on. So mm. the way it would place level exits and that sort of stuff wasn't as finely tuned or as interesting as what they ended up with. Yeah. So it feels like Clay knew where they were going, but only through early access worked out how they were going to get there. Mm. And there's not very many games in early access that I think have done as good a job of going through that process updating regularly and coming out as a much better game and you play it on a, on a roll at the moment it's mm. done loads of amazing games in completely different genres yeah yeah, it's really and impressive it's, they're, I can't wait to see what they make next the next game is Rocket L where L stands for League <laughs> <laughs> thanks Martin mm. I like game, this game mm. I also like this game I'm really, really bad at it. I think out of all the games on this list, it's the one game I really wish I was better at. Mm. Uh, mm. Because I'm so incompetent, and yet it it's just so tactile and pleasurable to be in that game. And very frustrating that I can't be as useful to my teammates. 
it's been amazing watching people uh, like Andy Kelly from work or Sam Roberts from PC Gamer as well um, go through some of the cycles of anger and despondency that comes with seriously getting into a game. <laughs> yeah. These are people who I would never have thought would really seriously invest in a, in a competitive thing. Like, I got them to try Dota and that was never going to stick. And they've sort of like looked at me weirdly when I've talked about the emotions that I've gone through competing in a thing. Things that you discovered through HOTS, which mm. we're going to talk about later. But, um, but like, I've seen Sam sort of like boiling with rage at the inadequacies of whoever he's matched with. And go through the terror of Elo Hell and all the rest of this <laughs> stuff. He's stuck in the trench because no one else is as good as him in the life of it. Mm. And that's been it's been really vindicating. That's not the only reason that game is good. Um, <laughs> but it's but actually it's almost a testament to the fact that it is good that it's drawn people who would never have normally competed in a game in that way into to this kind of like hardcore world of car football hockey. <laughs> it's it's getting, really, getting, people, sorry, it's getting people to play a football game. Yeah. If you were <laughs> for rage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. in the office of the <laughs> yeah. FIFA game. Yep. Yeah. It's been a really good year for extremely small games that know exactly what they are. Yeah, I, really unusual this year. Like I was going to mention Broforce later, just literally to mention it. But I mean, I think obviously they're quite dissimilar in every way. But apart from the fact that they are both, they just know themselves really well. They know exactly the kind of experience they want to give, and they're perfectly made with that in mind. Rocket League is a sequel, right? There's yes, it there's is. Yeah. This game called like Rocket Fuel Powered Su- Acrobatic Cars, something like Super Powered <laughs> Acrobatic Rocket Cars or something mm. like that. Yeah, for the PlayStation Three, mm. it wasn't didn't come on PC, and this is the first time it has. But yeah, it's like it's a brilliant idea to the extent that you couldn't. People call it Cars plus Football, but it doesn't really feel like two things. It feels like Rocket League. It feels like Rocket League is a distinct sport that happens to involve cars and balls, but somehow works for me. It's mm. better than either driving games or football games. Um, because of the combination of things and it's gotten really good as well that's worth pointing out because we talked about it a lot when it came out mm. but the recent updates they've done have been really really good partly at making the game because it got quite hardcore like I started playing it between Dota games with friends and then it became <laughs> the, we all getting really into it and playing it on multiple platforms and stuff and, and then worrying constantly about you know trying to get better at doing aerials and that kind of thing then they added all these mutators so you can queue for a game that has random modifications like a big square ball or like a huge ball that barely fits in the goal but has really really high gravity so it's ping ponging around no one fucking scores for five minutes because no one can actually get it to fit like, and that sort of thing sort of makes it fun again and makes it more like the old days of Rocket League so compared to a lot of competitive games it's done a really good job of making it not kind of collapse in on itself yeah it's true actually, on the weight of the ability of the player base I mean, most competitive games now kind of slowly migrate towards eSport, basically, and to the high ends of play. But I think Rocket League has done a very good job of preserving, basically, new play. Mm. The Scrubs. It's a good Scrub game. It's because it's also a bit like Gang Beasts. Yeah. Um, which maybe should be on this list. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's not out yet. It's certainly only access. It's certainly access. Thank came God. came out in the last year. Yeah. So it's, wow. It's definitely not out yet. Yeah. yeah. The whole year. <laughs> like, Jeez. the original release to final release. I mean, Gang Beasts is more slapstick, but Rocket Rock League has that on slapstick to it. It's not this. It's not. It's not Invisible Age, which maybe goes without saying. But uh, but now I want to play a stealth. A lot of game. people think it is, but <laughs> now I want to play a stealth game where you have to get a really unwieldy beach ball through like a <laughs> cyberpunk mega corporation's office. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are some like turn-based games. Uh, I think you talked before about like a, a turn-based chariot racing game. Mm. Mm. Turn-based games in action-based genres are really funny to me. There's there's a shoot 'em up that is um, maybe it's not turn based maybe it's more like pause based but it's a sort of really hectic spaceship top down shoot 'em up and when you pause time or maybe at the end of your turn or whatever uh, it shows arcs of where everything's going to go and you create like gravity wells to try and curve people's bullets around what? as you see visualizations. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Be great if you can remember. Now you're going to ask me what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. It took me a moment, but the chariot racing game is called Quadriga. Quadriga. Right. Mm-hmm. It's fucking great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blood Bowl as well. It's mm. turn-based city sports game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one thing I love about Rocket League finally is that uh, you, you literally you are only ever ten seconds away from a game of Rocket League if you're at yeah. your PC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The match rate, the speed of it is so that's hard to you know, I, underrate how good that is. Yeah, I think that's the reason it did get its hooks into me. I haven't really stuck with it like lately, but um, I played it a lot, and I'll probably go back to it eventually. Yeah. And it's largely because the rounds are so short and most competitive games I bounce off because I like I don't like losing and <laughs> uh, I'm not good at winning <laughs> uh, and that's true of Rocket League as well but it's only like three minutes or something and then the next round is happening and uh, you can you know just quit out and get a different match if you're yeah. totally outclassed often I do play through because it's kind of 
interesting because almost always my partner will quit. I play like 2v2 or 3v3 um, and uh, usually my partner will quit <laughs> because we failed and we suck. You probably noticed that I sucked in particular. Uh, but it's fun to tr- try and like to take it back. Best noises made by a human. In the the noises mm. you, you everybody makes when you play rugby, yeah. yeah. I didn't yeah. think I was capable of hooting like the proles who used mm. to play the football games in the in the PC game. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, um, it's made Martin less classist, and if anything, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it hasn't. No, it <laughs> it hasn't. That would have been yeah. cheap and too far for any game. <laughs> no, it's true. Actually. I think um, I I'm no stranger to frustration with failure. But mm. Rocket League's one of the few games where when I win, I'm a real fucking jerk. About it. <laughs> yeah, really yeah I say all like, the jerk yeah. things. I, I shout a lot when I'm playing Dota, but like, there's nothing like the like. I'm used to shouting like words, but in terms of like no, noiseless just, vocalizations, just vowel sounds. Like groups of people on Skype <laughs> going, "Oh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> like, It's great. It's great. It's great. How do you guys feel about pillars? Are they good or bad? Are they structurally necessary? Well. Yeah, they last How for a long, long time, they apparently. <laughs> uh, We're talking about Pillars of Eternity, which is an RPG, I think. Can't remember. <laughs> uh, this isn't your vote, then. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a main Tom, I think. Yeah, this is a, this year's best RPG. Yeah. That's wow. a pretty controversial statement. Wow, yeah. yeah. The Witcher Tom will now go outside for... to face the entire <laughs> Witcher community. <laughs> they know what I look like now. Uh, yeah. so, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's, I was expecting it to be nostalgic fluff, to be mm. frank. Because it's uh, harking back to the um, the old Baldur's Gate games and the old kind of top-down view, and you've got a little party, and you know, there's some very slow scrolling text, and then an incredibly seric and complicated combat system happens, and it kind of still has all that stuff in it. Uh, but it is beautiful, and the combat itself is far better explained than it ever was, and actually streamlined because they're not tied to Dungeons and Dragons anymore. Mm. They've developed their own system for a video game from the ground up. And that means that, you know, it just gets rid of loads of the dice rolling bullshit that people used to arbitrarily put in those games in order to kind of be faithful to the D&D license. Mm. So what you end up with is like a load of interesting classes uh, that overlap with each other in interesting ways. And an interesting kind of tactical positioning game, a real-time pause positioning game about, you know, you have tanks that can block areas and you have wizards that can fling from the back and you've got... Um, bards who literally playing like it's like the phrase wizards fling from the back <laughs> yeah. that's what they do uh, I think and then if I was if I was writing a song for Kesha that's what it would be <laughs> possible podcast title yeah um, yeah and uh, you've got like bards who you're kind of you're arranging musical passages that's how you make their spells you kind of swap bars in and change oh, right. them around and stuff and that becomes there's a, there's a kind of rhythm to the song where the first part of the song will be like a healy part of the song mm. and everyone feels healed and happy then there's the angry part of the song <laughs> and, then, and then there's the summon skeletons part uh, yeah, of the song yeah that's when she gets really <laughs> straight is it Kesha always includes one of yeah. that's, that's the drop yeah it's the skeleton drop yeah. um, and they uh, <laughs> that's, that's just you, uh, could you in that game that's... have like I don't know is there, there, I think there's a song that causes fear Mm. I wonder if you could do that at lesser and greater variant so you could have like spooky then scary then skeletons as a anyway <laughs> <laughs> good idea Chris <laughs> that's just uh, that's just one class in the game and even the kind of the tanky knight characters are really fun to equip and they they all look amazing and beautiful uh, and uh, like I'm so used to combat in RPGs being bad just straight just outright bad mm. <laughs> it's the thing yep. that you just get through in order to get to the cool bits of the game uh, in Pillars it's actually a completely worthwhile investment of your time and it's frequently interesting even if you're trying to stealth it and it goes wrong then you always kind of you come up, I've come up with like a load of formations you can make custom formations for your people and then you know if, if I've been discovered I immediately snap into the combat formation and then look for choke points like a doorway or something for to stack my tanks in mm-hmm. so I get my wizards behind them uh, and then get the bear in around the side you can get a bear they don't fling from the back they don't they fling from the front or the flanks if they're going to join you unexpected from the flanking bear um, and yeah just how combat actually means something as well as there being an interesting kind of RPG mm-hmm. kind of, an interesting world with all its bespoke lore um, do yeah. love the bespoke lore I was going to highlight the lore actually yeah. and I love lore but it's, it's really no- it's, it's nice to have a, a, a game story particularly for an RPG that I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the most inventive fiction in the world because it is going to be fantasy fiction, but it has enough going for it mm. in ways that it's sufficiently interesting to keep you engaged. A lot of really interesting characters. But also, it doesn't sort of... This is a weird thing to say, particularly as somebody who really loves Mass Effect and Dragon Age, but it doesn't lean on 
interpersonal drama to completely to carry the story, right? Mm. It's not all about your sort of your your sort of close relationships with one or two characters. Basically in order to you have the freedom to say, I don't want to party with you anymore, go away. Like it doesn't really force you to take anyone with you. And for that reason it has a feeling I didn't realise I'd missed from Baldur's Gate or from similar role playing games, which is that kind of like you're role playing with a GM like there's sort of more voices in play and every story is its own little self-contained thing mm. and it feels more naturally episodic and like your companions can just come and go mm. and so on and that sort of enhanced as you build up your manor and your estate which is sort of the centre of the game and there's sort of a like a like a, a gentleness to that that makes it easier to dip in and out of it's not sort of which is it's maybe a strange thing to praise it for but it's never like as intense as Bioware game which over the years as they got as they've got better at it mm. have become so, so overwhelmingly about personal relationships and moments where you have to choose like do you want to kiss this person or murder their dad and like <laughs> that's your choice <laughs> like pillars is pillars is mostly like like going to the pub with friends you've known for ages and no one really particularly wants to talk about themselves which is <laughs> it becoming more appealing to me <laughs> it's, right. it's great I, uh, it's one, another one of these games that's uh, benefited enormously from Kickstarter um, mm. because it, all of the stretch goals are brilliant and because they've made so much money those stretch goals are all worthwhile and have actually fleshed out into the, uh, something that feels much more yeah, interesting even in The Witcher 3 for me as a you know as Chris says you can build up your manor and your manor house and I believe that was a stretch goal mm. there's this huge enormous winding dungeon beneath your manor that was a stretch goal as well and uh, also all of the backers um, oh wait you're talking manor as in large house yeah, yeah. I was building oh, your manor yeah. as in magic resource so, <laughs> oh, 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 oh you your manor manor as in like you know good, good vocabulary and like please <laughs> oh, 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 big manor's house <laughs> there should be a manor <laughs> Should be a manor <laughs> um, Yeah, that's another stretch goal. And there, um, a lot of the backers, like the past a certain point, you got to have you get to have a little story told about you. You're, you become an NPC in the world, and because the gift of your character is that you can kind of see into their soul in mm. some way. Mm. And um, you, you sell the, these characters that they, they stand apart because I think um, they're the gold. They, they kind of they, they're they're also dressed in more kind of fancy armor. I think mm. I think the backers might have had a the opportunity to design their own character, their own PC that actually went into the game. Mm. Mm. They look like player characters, so that yeah. makes sense. Which is uh, which is amazing because you go into a, a, a bar and this is actually like more D and D than most D and D games get because mm. you see these NPCs that are actually other people as though they're forming yeah. adventuring parties <laughs> themselves. And then you can go up to them and you click on them, you kind of read their soul, and there's a, you get like three or four paragraphs of just nicely written fancy text that has their own little short story for them. And because there's so much of that in the world, that they're, they're everywhere because there's so many backers. It makes it feel so rich. They feel mm. like everyone in every pub like has a story. I think that's what I was gesturing at with the kind of that feeling of it not being about single intense relationships, but about this kind of like much broader richness where everything you go there's a little story and yeah, it's, yeah. it's up to loaded to fucking balls with vignettes that game it is it's just vignettes as fuck it's yeah. I like the idea that the Kickstarter backers must have received an email saying thank you Kickstarter backer please type in your soul <laughs> <laughs> players going to be able to read your soul when I you can't believe the players just, just write vignettes I think they're just, <laughs> no, they're, they're like, sort of the, the writing involved in that is extraordinary yeah. like, this, there are other games with great writing on this list but in terms of like just effort involved in making hundreds of things that are all individually good even if it's just three paragraph short stories but they're all different hmm. like you know one will be just like you know two beats of a pirate's life as they cling to a mast and attempt not to die in a storm and <laughs> another one will be like a, a courtesan poisoning a master or something and it's just you know hmm. it's relentless is this stuff you see through the soul yeah you basically uh, these two characters might be standing talking to each other in a pub but when you click on them you'll get text describing like one key moment from that character's life like one defining moment from their life at any point so the fiction does go all over the place it's not like you find a boring one who's like, and then he stood in the pub and looked at <laughs> So is it like that they're talking to this other person but they're secretly thinking about that time they're a strapped to a master? I don't know. You have, you have the power to like see people's essences, basically. So it's like, I don't know, maybe they somehow became themselves at that moment or something. So that's the point you see them. I don't know. I think the great, the great thing about Pillars and um, its world depth is it's a test of the power of reading. And you mm. have to do a lot of reading playing that game. But um, the fact that they don't have to animate, you know, set up animation rigs for every single story thing they want to tell, they can yeah. just have like, uh, they can just write it down in a few paragraphs and the writer's skilled enough, then you get a sense of that. Uh, and they even use this to add detail that they couldn't otherwise show given the view that you're in because you're obviously in suspended top down view and it looks beautiful but you, you're never going to see the, the carving of some alien language in the wall so what they do is that you can click on um, you know a highlight and it will give you these passages explaining like this is this carving and you can interact with it so it becomes a little kind of text adventure mm. that happens inside the world just to kind of give extra just really 
granular small details to, to another I think it's so it also does that for character it's, interactions as well like mm. it'll do novelistic sort of uh, action descriptions so it'll say a character looks at his feet when he talks or something and that's represented in the game but it allows them to do weirdly more convincing acting yeah. than you get if you have a cutscene that's animated and that's just incredibly hard so in terms of efficiency it's much more efficient than getting mocap to in, in, you know, unconvincingly have a guy like fidget while he's talking or something yeah and, and you can see you, you just tell it's why people have just read loads and loads of fantasy fiction and yeah. just love it fucking love it and just uh, there's a lot of passion in it and it's just a fantastic RPG what's the bomb called the god hammer <laughs> god hammer <laughs> one of the key points in the backstory that I really fucking love is that this false prophet this isn't really a spoiler because it's the first part of the game stuff mm. this, this person who wandered out of the woods claiming to be a messenger of the old gods was killed by the god hammer and you find out fairly quickly that the god hammer was just a really big bomb <laughs> and I love that fact mm. so it wasn't magic they just blew him the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> the way you're talking about it it sounds like another game on the list when you say it's fignet as fuck that's 80 days uh-huh. Uh-huh. which is an incredibly well written game about travelling all over the world in which you meet people for just brief moments of time have little dalliances with them maybe give them a little smooch they really are dalliances mm. yeah and then move on and it's wonderful for that and it's wonderful also for a single relationship which is your relationship with Phileas Fogg because you play <laughs> Passport to, and it becomes depending on how you want to play it a game about kindness about being nice to the man that you're with and deciding whether mm. you're going to Give his moustache a lovely comb to calm him down when he's feeling a bit seasick, or whether you're going to go out and find some ladies to romance. Even if yeah, he's an aloof and uh, possibly psychopathic jerk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, he's really cold. <laughs> he's just completely unmoved by But you can totally win his respect. <laughs> there's yeah, no, there's, you know, I, I had one moment where he, like, broke that facade briefly, and it was quite powerful because of that. Um, and I, this was just, like... My third playthrough, maybe, um, and on previous playthroughs, I think, I, I think I maybe made it on all of them, but you know, just like in more than eighty days. And then my my last one was on PC, which was my first time on PC, and I made it in less than eighty days. Um, and the PC version is actually like really messed up for me. The the art on it, the assets that they've used are massively downscaled from what's on the iOS version, which is weird to me because my phone is this big and my PC is this big. <laughs> and so if you use the same assets, I would have noticed some small flaws in it, but I would have been fine with it. But when you downscale it for PC, that seems completely bizarre to mm. me and it's really rough. Like the clouds are just super pixely and blurry and it's like things that are different resolutions that one resolution the icons are a different resolution that really bothered me at first and I was almost not going to play it on PC but having it on a big screen is actually a really big deal because reading on my iPhone is not a pleasant experience at all I don't have an iPad so it's always been just iPhone or PC hmm. and uh, my playthrough on PC was probably the first one I really kind of enjoyed and I kind of it's a game about travel and you go to different places and you encounter different things and often the game element of it is quite separate from the story element of it, where um, you're trying to get around the world in 80 days. I don't know if that was clear. But <laughs> let's make that clear. Um, and the game element of it is just like, how can you? What's the fastest route? You know, what's the shortest time we can get to the furthest city, and what's the best, most efficient travel route? And then once you know that, sometimes that journey isn't leaving until the next day, and then you might want to explore the city because you've got time to. Um, you wouldn't normally kind of like miss a journey to explore the city for narrative reasons. Um, so then the narrative stuff kind of happens if you, while you're waiting for the game stuff to start happening again. And for some reason, like on my phone, I got way more into the game side of it. I Because reading itself was not pleasurable and there's a lot of text to get through in the narrative side of it. Um, I, I, I recognise the writing was good, but I wasn't... I was impatient to get through it. I was like, come on, come on, come on. I want to leave next tomorrow because I need to sell this cool scarf I just got for like twice the price and then I can pay extra to go further on my next journey because you can sometimes bribe people to leave sooner. Um, and so I was too engaged with the game stuff and it conflicted with the narrative stuff. And then on PC, just, just it being on a bigger screen, it was nicer to read things and I was more looking forward to getting to the next place to see what adventures I'd get into and, um, and I was eager to go exploring and find out what, Asper 2 would encounter and the stuff he does encounter I really like him as a character <laughs> he has a very much personality of his own even when you get dialogue options they're all of a kind um, and he's very polite um, he's very 
you always get the option to be like super respectful to people. You can always kind of just like whatever the person's excited about, you always have the option to say, "Oh my god, that's amazing! I can't believe that you've done that." Or like uh, you can be really admiring of everyone. Um, and sometimes you can express like slightly offish opinions, but um, it kind of comes through that he's a, he's just a very respectful person. And um, I think I said on the podcast before when we talked about it that that to me is a kind of power fantasy. It's the power to be <laughs> no matter how stressful the situation you're in you can just be unflappably polite <laughs> and respectful to everyone yeah it's great and I found that the uh, being nice to Fog and not being nice is basically the difference between failure and victory because <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the first time I failed it horribly so I went down through the Amazon I think he caught he caught some terrible disease and I was like laid up for two weeks and we were way of schedule and I, I, I tweeted about it and then Richard Cobbett tweeted back saying no you just gotta uh, just leave let that guy go just <laughs> don't don't comb his stuff don't iron anything don't and just just ignore him completely he'll become you know pale and ill and, and drawn but you'll get there on time that's what you've got you've got, you just gotta you know just gotta, you have one job that's what you do <laughs> but you just gotta you know ride that pony into the dust <laughs> to, win, to win his that's, that's it's, it's an interesting design thing because most games they give you a health meter but it's your health whereas the health meter in 80 yeah, days is Fox else. it's someone else's yeah. and it's the, the, the um, Inco Studios the people who make this they talk about it in terms of it's the Walking Dead thing where the reason Clementine will remember that works in that game is that it's a bit of parenting advice mm. it makes you feel responsible for this little girl and that's why it doesn't work so well in Telltale's other games is that you don't feel responsible for the person because when an adult character you get told they will remember that you just think okay well, of course they fucking get <laughs> <when> they remember <laughs> what, what they a, adult human well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> grown up and like mm. Fog is essentially a child that mm. you have to look after <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. but it means that all your decisions then become a form of role play. They become like how are you treating this other person? Mm. I love the way um, you play in coats as well. That's the whole point, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the way that choices are written in that game because they're they're not like outright statements. They're kind of gestures in different directions. About which kind of you you buy into the gesture depending on what aspects of the fiction you want to uncover more of. So it'll be like, oh, do I want to know more about this guild or that guild? And it's it, it kind of feels collaborative because like. The bit, the bit of text you choose then becomes part of another mm-hmm. sentence they've written for you. And I think that's a, it's a really beautiful mm-hmm. kind of balance of power to it, um, where I, I don't feel screwed over by a conversation option because they're not really conversation options, they're just kind of doors that you open to different parts of the book. Sometimes the options you're choosing aren't what action you're going to take. Sometimes it's the outcome yeah, to an no, action that you didn't decide. You yeah. just get to decide what happened after mm-hmm. yeah. you did a thing. But uh, I, is, I got so much joy out of that. So many little moments of surprise mm-hmm. from the way that those, you know, the story would turn on those, those moments. It's amazing that that's not more jarring because that's such yeah. a fundamental break from everything that game dialogue choices are normally. It's yeah, just sure. an absolute rule that, you know, you choose what your character says, obviously you don't mm-hmm. choose what the outcome is. That would be mad. But uh, it turns out if you do that, it's not that jarring, and also it's quite cool. Like it's yeah, it's great. It's obviously, you, sometimes you can sort of tell. Well, it sounds like this one goes badly, so let's choose the other one. But it doesn't come up that often. Like most of the time, it's kind of you, I just go with what feels right for my character and yeah. how the story's going. It's worth saying that, like, if if we're if we're calling out pillars for sort of this extraordinary group writing effort, mm. then Eighty Days is an extraordinary individual mm. writing effort. Like. <laughs> Make Jane. Make Jane. I was trying to pronounce the surname. Like, in, but in terms of just, it's crazy that one person produced that with some <laughs> writing and editing by John Ingold, who's right. one of the founders of Inco Studios, who we've talked about on the podcast before because he wrote "Make It Good." Oh, the, really? Yeah, oh, that was wow. what he did before he founded Inco <laughs> with a uh, with another guy, their tech guy. That was the um, sort of PI uh, text adventure. Yeah, uh, that was really good. Hmm. Cool. Well, not good. But still. But you know, no. mainly Meg, you know, Meg yeah. is the main writer. Yeah. Meg, but, um, yeah, amazing. That's really interesting. I knew, I, I knew that name from Inkle Studios, but I hadn't pieced it together with the game that I've talked about on this podcast <laughs> before. We may need to go a little bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cities Skylin, I've written here. Cities Skyrim. I can talk about that real quick. <laughs> yes, I used to install SimCity 4 every year to still play it for a little bit for like two weeks before I get bored of it again put it away <laughs> for yeah. another 12 months but that game came out in 2004 and despite having had a sequel a couple of years ago I was still doing it now I don't have to because City Skylines has taken its place <laughs> um, it, it is just the best 
city management game that's out there, and it captures the things that I enjoyed most about SimCity games and the things that the most recent SimCity kind of abandoned, mm. which are mostly stuff to do with traffic flow. <laughs> like, making efficient roads is the mm. most satisfying mm. thing in a city management game. It's not placing down a police station to cast an area of effect police spell yeah. to stop crime that you can't see. <laughs> well, roads it's, are what define the shape of a city yeah. together, really. And City Skylines does such a great job of showing you all the cars on the mm. road. You can see thousands and thousands of cars driving about, and if there is a traffic jam, you can really clearly see the cars tailing all the way back and it's really satisfying to then work out well how do I break this flow where are these cars trying to get to and how can I stop this bottleneck and can I do it public transport and so forth that's a really interesting challenge um, and just by giving a lot of detail to that simulation and giving you large maps to play with the other ways that they cut corners that SimCity from 2013 didn't don't actually matter it's great I love that such a, a great game has come out of what's essentially kind of a cynical uh, decision to make very quickly after this game had flopped to make the game that people <laughs> mm. clearly obviously wanted in its place. Well, it's, but, uh, do you think great. it's cynical or do you think that's just oh, a, a, no, a it's passion? Just, almost. I think it's passion because it's made by a Colossal Order who previously developed two games, mm. uh, Cities in Motion and mm. Sequel Cities in Motion yeah, 2, yeah, which were about all about traffic yeah, yeah. and public uh, transport in Did they make the Cities XL as well in the previous no, Cities games? No, okay. those, oh, right. those were made by a different studio oh. and uh, total bullshit and they went... <laughs> well, well, well mm. like, the originally, original Cities XL developers went bust like six months after that game came out oh, wow. and the rights and the code and the assets were bought by another company who have continually re-released that game with very minor adjustments and new titles. <laughs> Whereas um, they, mm. they only did Cities in Motion and Cities in Motion 2, which was all about, it was essentially transport type games. Mm. You didn't build the cities, you built the railway network to right. help cargo and that sort of stuff. And they said they always wanted to make a city management game, mm. but they didn't think there was any way that they would ever be allowed or have the money to do it. Mm. But after some city flopped, they went to Paradox and went, <laughs> Could do that. <laughs> yeah. And they made it in Unity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Went around. Okay. With, what, with really? a team yeah. of like seven people. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Unbelievable. God, that's so amazing. Pretty Someone good. in EA feels. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be. I mean, I feel sorry for the you know the actual team on SimCity because it feels like it's scuppered a lot by mm. high level decisions. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. I'm not. And yeah, I think all of the team heads on SimCity quit mm. within like three months of it coming out, which is never a great sign. What about hers, Tory? <laughs> <laughs> that was my favourite Tory of the year. <laughs> her story is uh, fantastic. It's a detective game essentially, but it's so rare when you're covering games full time to. For games to come in that it's a, if all feels like a new genre, feels like a mm. new, uh, just an entirely new way of interacting with the game, and especially brilliant is that it's so simple. It's simply a search bar and a big database of video clips, and with that and a one-on-one performance, like uh, FMV mm. games are back now because of her. Uh, you know, definitely <laughs> the best full motion video game of 2013. <laughs> so at like, least that, yeah. <laughs> FMV is um, it has always been like an awkward thing because it's sort of expensive to produce but then it also ends up looking amateur a lot of the time mm. and this is I feel like Sam Barlow has just found this like unique situation oh, hopefully not unique but like a situation no one else has come up with before where it makes sense to have one camera it doesn't need to be particularly good quality focus on one person without necessarily good lighting in one room and just that's all you need and so it's easy to produce and uh, that covers the just the full scope of the game. I think it, it's a genius piece of scoping mm. than anything. It's like it's so <laughs> difficult. Project management of the year. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it sounds like kind of dry, but it, that's so hard. It's so <laughs> difficult. Yeah. That is the that is the reason ninety percent of people fail at the game they're making is because the the idea they have might be good, but the scope of what it takes to make it is so difficult. Mm. And I'm not saying I'm not saying how it's always easy to make, but. Um, it's so efficient, like all of the effort that they put into it, I think, comes through completely in the final thing and adds so much to it. It's and the, the interface of searching for clips uh, by, you know, you type in a word, if it comes up in the transcript of any of the clips, which are, you know, anywhere between like five seconds to two minutes, um, then that clip will be included, but it'll only show you the first five chronologically and not by relevance or by any other metric, which means because there's a series of interviews over a series of days, the more revealing stuff is towards the end. 
And so to see a clip towards the end, which will probably be more revealing as to the plot, you need to think of a term that not only comes up in that conversation, but that's never come up before. So it's kind of, it's a really smart system for like encouraging a player to guess the revelations and say, you know, <laughs> if you think this plot, the, the final twist is going to be X, then try searching for X, because if that really is the final twist, it's not going to be in the early clips, it's going to be in the late clips. It's part of the fun of any detective fiction, is trying to work out who did it, um, um, which you no detective game ever really simulates. Even if you're going through the process of trying to solve the crime because you are the detective, <laughs> you're never encouraged to do the thing you do when you're watching Jonathan Creek of skipping ahead to the last five minutes <laughs> and trying to work out how the fuck did this happen. Yeah. I'm reading a book at the moment where um, uh, called The Tokyo Zodiac Murders where about 70% of the way through it has a, an inter... I think it's inter... I can't remember what it's called. But a, a chapter where the author talks directly to you and says, by now, you have read enough information to guess what the <laughs> final <laughs> awesome solution yeah. is to this mystery. <laughs> so I encourage you to stop here and just sit here and think about it for a while. <laughs> and I, I almost did because it was quite engaging. Um, and I, I had I had one little like clue as to, like, I think it's going to be, I think this mystery, the answer to that is this. But I had no idea about anything else. And I didn't, I didn't trust the book enough that the lo- solution would be perfectly logical, so I kept reading. And then it comes up with another one. I couldn't let you like, you should really stop now, because you've had all the information, then you've had a bunch of hints, so you really, you should really stop and think about it. I still it's, didn't. It's, it's always <laughs> the character played by the most famous actor. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, with her story, like, I think, again, talking about writing and games, but like, just a, it is incredibly efficient but in order to be a game about language and for an order of that puzzle to work and for it to be a puzzle also tells a story that lasts about the right amount of time regardless of the the player and so on that's an extraordinarily clever piece of writing because when a player can search for any word every single word that's used matters yeah. but because they are supposed to be off the cuff interviews with one character everything that's said needs to sound natural and that's like that honestly is, is mind boggling to me I have a single criticism of that game and that there is what I think is either a cheat code or an easter egg in it that sort of spoils it and I can totally get the temptation to put it in there there's a phrase you can search for hmm. that is quite obvious and if you search for it you get one video there's only one video in which that phrase shows up even though it's quite obvious and it kind of gives you all the things you need to know to immediately solve everything. <laughs> yeah, I think Matt Castle hit that. And as, yeah. as a result, he kind of felt that he didn't really... Yeah, so I, I hit it during a moment of, not weakness, because I was just like, I was running out of ideas. And I'd gotten most of the story, but I was somewhere, some distance from getting to the end. Maybe like 80% of the way there. And so I broke away from my logical series of searches and my own investigation and typed in something that I was like, I wonder if there's a result for this just as a joke really like almost me making fun of the game and there is and it bumps you ahead loads mm. and that I think is like honestly if, I, if there was a director's cut of, of, of her story it would simply remove that one thing because <laughs> anyone who knows I don't want to spoil it because it really is yeah, a spoiler sure, yeah. <laughs> but um, but that's the best of criticism is because it's the one point where the script becomes slightly self-referential or, or sort of mm. you know sort of plays with the naturalisticness of naturalisticness for me of that of that Dialogue and that extraordinary performance actually as well, which is also worth highlighting. Is like games don't usually get really, really, really good acting in them. But I I ran it as a murder mystery for my family in France. Um, uh, they I I've always wanted to like show them the cool things I like about games, but there are so few games where the, the interface is good enough mm. that I can actually get them to interact with it. And so for this, I still kind of ran it. I had it on my laptop and I just asked them what do you want to search for, and obviously they will watch the clips. Um, and we'd watch all the new ones that um, uh, that came up, and it was so interesting watching them all go through it. So it was like four people, and uh, so combined, obviously they had a lot more kind of brain power than I was working with than I did, um, and so they got something super fast that I didn't get for you know hours later. But then other things, just really basic stuff about like um, sort of why it was done. And actually, even who did it, they were mistaken about for a very long time. Did you get angry at them? You saying, come no, on! No, no, no. <laughs> it was fascinating. I was, I was frantically taking notes. I was writing down, like, I tried to write down every search they made, but I didn't manage oh, to do that quite. Um, but they were, they got so fixated on little details that I didn't even care about. And they sort of even found out more than me about certain things. But there were these big fundamental things that, from their perspective, they didn't know why the person who did it, who they thought they did it, did it. But, um, they weren't that curious about that for some reason, or it didn't seem like a gap. They just like, oh, as long as they figured out how it was possible, then um, they were happy with that and just wanted to know more background and stuff. 
And I was sitting there knowing that it wasn't that person, it wasn't that reason. <laughs> well, they didn't have a reason at all. And I'm like, you should really think about what the reason is. Um, and that, that was so interesting because when I played it myself, I had this brilliant, brilliantly structured thriller where it had, you know, twists and turns. And there was a, in particular, like a, an early moment, um, a clip which, where it seemed massively revealing. I wrote loads of notes about what it meant. Hmm. And then half an hour later, I came back and watched it again. And with new information that I had, everything that they said was inverted. And I realized everything I thought was significant. It was significant, but it meant something that was almost the opposite of what I thought it meant. And that was so good. Yeah, it's amazing that they, they build so many twists into a thing that feels autonomous. It feels like uh, you're mm. pushing through it, but yeah. actually the bombs drop for most people at you know, regular intervals. Yeah, that's it, crazy. That's which is amazing. Yeah. That piece of script. Yeah. How, did the, how, yeah. did, how did you do that? Yeah. No, it worked perfectly for me. I don't, just the, the, the pace of it was a great yeah. script. I don't, I don't know that I, I like the writing in it or the acting in it as much as other people. I thought the writing was, was fine, but I thought it was pretty heavy on symbolism, like <laughs> mirrors or what they call... <laughs> And all this other stuff. I, I, I don't know. But I, yeah, I, as, as a kind of production and a, and a kind of game and the execution of it, I thought it was great. So one of those games that like see more. knows what it is and is short. This is a lot of mm, games. Yeah, when you were talking earlier about yeah. games. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Knew what they were doing. Well, this, luckily, this is also a really small, compact game that we won't have much to talk about. Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of what I thought you were saying because it came out this year. Like, I think we've spoken about it enough yeah, yeah, the yeah. time to kind of everyone knows what it is. Um, it's... Brilliant, probably one of the best games ever made, I would argue, <laughs> simply because there's nothing else like it. No other game manages to be as many different things that Kerbal Space Program manages to be. Like, it's a cool puzzle game. It's mm. a great educational game, or, or if you're not doing anything about it education, it's a great way of encountering real stuff in a way that makes them feel more real to you. You can't play that game and not come away more appreciative of how rocket science actually works and how space travel actually works and how fucking difficult it is and how fucking <laughs> yeah, difficult and it is and likely it is yeah mm. um, you it's also a cool building game where you just make contraptions and try and do stuff so those are great internal rules that which are based on something called physics that's really complicated um, and but you can create all kinds of cool stuff and you can go on YouTube and be shamed by, <laughs> by people who are better at than you um, I mentioned a moment ago that I thought Invisible Ink was a triumph of early access because I played the first yeah, mode of it and didn't like it and it came out at the end of it and it was good and I love it. Um, whereas with Kerbal Space Program, I played the first release that they put up maybe on the tech source forums or something like that <clears> where literally you could just make, you know, build a little rocket from like six different parts, hold down a button and it would go up. And as far as I know, there wasn't even orbit yet. And so what you just go that? up and then fall down, maybe like 2012. Certainly, I still worked at PC Gamer at the time. Um, and it was still fucking great then. Like, mm-hmm. the, every, like, the core of that game is so much fun. Like, it is a great physics toy before it is a simulation mm. or a game. And then the fact that it's a great simulation and now a great game as well, everyone should play Kerbal Space Program. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't um, played it yet. Maybe I should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you really should. Yeah, yeah, you love it. It, sort of, it feels like it almost shouldn't be a game of any one year because it's obviously mm. like probably one of the best things <laughs> to happen in games. <laughs> it, is, it is. So it's like... On that. It is amazing. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of great management slash simulation games this year because Prison Architect also came out of Early Access mm. which yeah. is also a great game that I really like. But... I feel like everyone should play Kerbal Space Program, and I feel like Prison Architect is a game about prisons. So. <laughs> yeah, the like Kerbal is genuinely for everybody, which is you can't say about any games, or if you can say it, it's kind of a cliche. But you can like I think the genius of that game, one of many things, is that even though it's this super serious simulation of space flight, it looks silly and cartoony, which isn't jarring. It's actually kind of essential because it makes it okay to fail. And that game is about repeated failure in a way that NASA would never be allowed to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that, that is its one leap of, of, of fantasy, really. It's not the slight edges they sand off actual astrophysics. It's the fact that everyone's having a brilliant time, even when they're being plowed into the sides of things or lost in space forever. There's only really one settlement on Kerbin. It's the spaceport, and if you blow that up, they probably deserve it. They were launching the rocket in the first place. <laughs> you know, there's no sort of unfortunate moment when you accidentally launch a human analogue into a human settlement. You're always launching tiny green people who are just happy to be there to their death. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why it's good. <laughs> Heroes 
of the storm. No one cares about that. No. <laughs> Next. <Boy. laughs> I care a little bit about that game, although less and less of the months go on since I haven't played it. Really? Um, yeah, I haven't played it because Rich Stanton's computer reliably crashed every time he was playing it uh, after a while. I think some kind of process or a heating issue. Um, and so uh, because I only really like playing games with people I know, uh, multiplayer games, I, I stopped playing it as well. And um, that's a sad story. Well, yeah, but it's also given me kind of more perspective on the on, on the kind of experience that I got from it. And I'm not, I'm, I am keen to go back to it to a degree. But I don't. I think a lot of my love of it was purely addiction. <laughs> so, um, I think I'm, not my love of it was actually rich. <laughs> <laughs> that's true as well. Yeah, I play any game with rich. I would go into the fires of hell. I wouldn't. No, don't do that. Um, I saw him in Inferno with him. That'd be similar. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Um, yeah, it is. It is. I, I, I still think it is a bit like Baby's First Dota, but that's that's fine. And it's I, and I kind of think that as the months have progressed, it's kind of betrayed that in a way which, say, Rocket League hasn't. And I think more and more uh, choices are made by the people who are making that game to push it more to towards the pro scene or balance things more towards the pro scene. I'm sure they've got stats which contradict, you know, contradict this in terms of the, the wins and losses, but in terms of my pure enjoyment of it and in terms of how parsable things are, um, I, I feel it's, it's gotten further away from you know, my, my scrub land, which I, I like and like to defend. But e- even that said, I, I still think it, it's done a lot of good for that, Genre in terms of creating like I, and that and Smite, I think obviously yeah. I don't know anything about Smite, but hearing you talk about it, I think those three games more than others have done uh, done a lot to show that there's more there's more space in that genre than Dota occupies. Like Dota occupies one pole of that of the yeah. MOBA, and there are actually other experiences that you can have within it. Mm. I think yeah, and like I, I really respect Hots. Like I, I've been around the the block with it as people who've listened to this podcast a lot will know mm. um, I went through a period recently of playing a lot solo I feel like now and this is just testing to something else like my hot sort of solo time was me exercising a lot of my solo ranked Dota demons because I mm. hate playing Dota solo because Dota is really complicated and really personal and and it sucks like I played a game today and I played my fucking heart out and I lost and I genuinely did lose because of an asshole <laughs> an actual asshole but hot it feels like being a bigger kid in a smaller pond and you can kind of like steer it a lot mm. and there's like there's no visible MMR but I went and sorted out from the hot logs tracking site that gives you an <laughs> MMR and it was like your MMR is going up constantly and I was like thanks hot logs I feel good about myself and so it <laughs> was it, matchmaking ma- matchmaking rating yeah so it was like like is your the website actually called hot logs hot logs hot logs <laughs> get your hot logs here um <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a game called Mars Warlogs. Mars yeah, Warlogs. Was, yeah. yeah, Mars Warlogs. It was shit, wasn't it? Yeah, I remember piece of name. Kicking though. its face off. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> but yeah, so like, and maybe that plays into the baby's first dose thing. That like, I mean, but yeah, I think for me personally, no game is ever going to be as meaningful or, hmm. or or lasting as as the other place. But but within its but in itself, I think Hearts is a really intelligently designed game, and I think having been to the hot panels at BlizzCon and stuff I'm actually kind of excited about what's going to happen to it this year or, or next year because they are completely reworking matchmaking again yeah I mean, like, that's the, that's that's the big, big thing that, I mean, that really did in the last months of playing hot I think this is what actually stopped me playing hot in spite of Richard you know, as a result of Richard's absence rather than carrying on in spite of that was that the matchmaking was just routinely fucking us basically uh, and it was it was made worse that we, that we weren't being matched with we weren't able to play um, yeah, the uh, pick and ban mode of the game uh, because yeah. we were trying to you know group up with three people and that was just forbidden for you know for the last like three months mm-hmm. I played it or something. I think Blizzard are really good at building multiplayer games. Maybe it goes without saying at this point, but they are actually good at it. Sometimes I forget that I think when I'm assessing mm-hmm. their stuff. Like they are genuinely talented at this stuff and at balancing it and recognizing the problems in it. And I think Hot has a future for that reason. And it is a clever game. Like it's worth saying on its own right, without simply being accessible Dota or the Dota that you can yeah. play with your friends. I'm being disingenuous when I call it Baby's First Dota. I, I, yeah. I like the way. And it's I take that back now. I mean, yeah. that's leak, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, that's a joke. Um, the uh, the like we've talked about this before, but like the 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 way that game is designed to emphasise 
uh, collective strategy and map control above yeah. maybe above farming or resource gathering or specifically or at least resource gathering you do gather resources but it's always time based it's always based on a particular time and it's part of your overall strategy rather than all of your overall strategy yeah and on individual fighting as well as less important than when you decide to start moving your power around the map it's and perhaps it's, less statsy as well because mm-hmm. there are just fewer I mean there are fewer items there aren't that many items you can't buy items in the game so yeah, you don't have to account for the, you know, the kind of modifiers that they provide so you don't have to have all these numbers in your head all the time yeah and there's this and, and that's actually in some ways more sophisticated because it makes the entire game about the things that are hardest to do in any of these games which mm-hmm. is make decisions that game is about making decisions and but, get people to make the same decisions that you've just made exactly <laughs> and like whereas you know Dota it's beautifully complicated at the highest level it's the best game I've made but <laughs> at, but at the level that most people play it it can be a game where you don't make any decisions because you load up a guide you buy all the items that are in the guide you try and kill people and if you lose it's everybody else's fault <laughs> whereas Hots doesn't, doesn't ask you to make loads of those decisions which mm-hmm. makes it look simpler but actually what the decisions it's make, asking you to make is well you don't get to choose how to build pick yeah. a powerful hero or build overpower, yeah. overpowered items it's about when are you going to go and where where are you going to go when you go somewhere when are you and going to hit the skeletons when are you going to hit the, the skeletons downstairs. exactly <laughs> Do you go downstairs to hit the skeletons straight away? Do you wait a little bit? Do you hit all the skeletons? Do you hit most of the skeletons? Do you hit any skeletons? Do you go upstairs and hit the bigger skeletons? <laughs> and so I on. I don't know what the answer is. It's basically chess. <laughs> <laughs> and that's enough about HOTS. The other game uh, that I want to talk about is Grow Home, which uh, is a tiny little game made by Ubisoft Reflections about a robot who likes plants. A tiny little game made by that tiny little... That's you. You are saying that in a mocking voice, but actually, I think Ubisoft Reflections is is the Liverpool studio of Ubisoft, and it seems is it? like yeah, is that what Driver is made? Yeah, that's why oh, Driver wow. San Francisco is made. In Driver San Francisco is fucking great. I think yeah. it's in Liverpool. <laughs> anyway, it's in Britain. Maybe it's Liverpool. Liverpool, 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 it's all the same. No, but the, no, no, I wasn't. I wasn't being mocking. Well, no, no, no. I mean, but you know, it's not made by. The the vast amass that is Ubisoft. Liverpool? It's oh. made. <laughs> <laughs> it's made by all Liverpudlians. They I made them. this, <laughs> um, and it has the kind of qualities of an uh, indie game. And it's really impressive and brilliant that Ubisoft has been able to foster that kind of indie creativity within its monstrousness. <laughs> um, and it is just this very small... Again, it's a small game that knows exactly what it is. You're just this robot which has a kind of cool physics-y kind of uh, walking procedural... I don't know, it's, it's not exactly animated. You kind of grab onto the landscape and yank yourself along by alternately using the triggers if you're using a, a gamepad. And it gives you a really kind of tactile feel. And a lot of the time you're clambering up stuff because you grow these giant beanstalks and you clamber up the beanstalks and you... Then you ride the beanstalks, which look quite phallic, into um, into big, you like this. big glowing vaginas of rock, and then um, you steer them, don't you, as you ride? Yeah, them. like like uh, you know, in at the end of um, like Dune. Yes, yeah, I was going to say Doctor Strangelove, yeah. but Dune is also a good. Uh, yeah, Dune's a better option. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all riding a big dick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and and then uh, having Dr. having. <laughs> And then having done that, the, your, your beanstalk grows even more. And it's, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's just a really... There's not... I mean, that's it. Go on. Like, you know, I mean, there are, other th- there are things to collect if you want to collect them. And, there, uh, and collecting stuff allows you to uh, grow yourself even further. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kind of nice... They're nice things just to drag around. It's a really tactile game. But mostly it's just this kind of physics sandbox with this very kind of simple goal that everything kind of pulls into you know there's nothing there's nothing extraneous there's no kind of flab to that game and again you know like the same with Rocket League all muscle or both of <laughs> yeah your beanstalk is just all muscle uh, and you've got to admire that kind of thing stand back and admire its majesty I was going to take a moment here before you move on to the next game. Um, at some point in the first half of this podcast... Oh God, we might pass that, but go on. Well, we'll find out. Uh, Marsh drew a penis. That's not true. I drew two. Uh, but one of them, I was trying to pay attention to somebody, okay. and so I drew really badly. All right, so um, I don't know if, if anyone listening to this or is, is familiar with 
um, like spot the ball style competitions in newspapers from a long time ago where mm-hmm. there'd be a picture of a, someone on a football pitch with the ball edited out and you'd have to guess where it was. Whoever emails questions at greatcrowbar.com <laughs> with the most accurate timestamp for when Let's Marsh, the first penis. Marsh drew the first penis in this episode of the podcast will get some kind of prize. <laughs> this is brilliant. This is like the moment in Tom's book where the authors stop the thing to ask, you know, who, do you know who the murderer was? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except in this out, case. Which one of us is dead? <laughs> um, By now you have all the information you need to, to judge when Marsh drew the penis. <laughs> yeah, it's not where he drew it, because that's obvious, it's when he drew it. <laughs> but we have no way of verifying this, because I don't remember when I drew it. <laughs> I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were just assuming that at some point Marsh drew a penis. Like, it's no. a very safe bet. It's safe. In yeah. any situation, Marsh has drawn a penis <laughs> after, within an hour. Yeah, the size I, might be a drawing of a penis. This one was really malformed because yeah, I had yeah, to look yeah, like yeah. I was interested in what Chris was saying. <laughs> <laughs> it went all wonky. It looks like a candle now. <laughs> I can test um, that uh, Grow Home's animation is physics based because I used a teleporter in Grow Home, which is a thing you unlock. And I came out of it with my head glued to the floor. <laughs> so I was just kind of like spasming out like that with my yes. elbows above my head. Uh, and uh, I was stuck like that for some minutes. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. It's, that's what's so good about the game. It's, 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 <laughs> like, it started as a, uh, an experiment in physics animation. Oh, and then the game how? grew from that. Yeah, 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 it was I like they, they were experimenting with physics animation systems. And then went, yeah, this is kind of fun. <laughs> so you see just this wonderful flail of limbs that has all this momentum behind it. And, you know, I, I don't know, there's just something so pleasing about playing with I, something. I, I genuinely wasn't being disingenuous or... Genuinely wasn't genuinely, being disingenuous, disingenuous. Genuinely. or mocking before when yeah, I said about genius. that tiny company Ubisoft. Because <laughs> I think, you know, if we were to give a, an award to the best AAA publisher, I think it's Ubisoft. I think they make the mm-hmm. most interesting yeah. games. From Rainbow Six Siege, which we'll talk about in a little <laughs> bit. But just over the last few years, whether it's Rayman or From Dust or Grow Home or... Baby's first World War One game. Yeah, also the Child Child of Light was Child uh, of Light. Yeah. Interesting, not great, but kind of interesting. Yeah, and what was that World War Two game that uh, Baby's uh, first uh, World War II game. Oh, the Sad <laughs> yeah. Dog in the Nasty War. Or whatever yeah, I, yeah, Valley of Hearts. I admire the fact that they made it. <laughs> so do you want to talk about Rainbow Six now? We can skip ahead. There's no there's no reason to do it in this particular order. Sure, they made Rainbow Six. What a game! <laughs> You've played really Rainbow cool. Six. Yeah, I have now. I played it with you and uh, Owen and Daniel last night. Yeah, it's really dismaying that you are way better than me <laughs> I've been playing it loads. <laughs> I, the only skills I used, it, like I don't know the maps at all and I don't know the tools very well. No, don't rub it in. <laughs> the, uh, in. So it's an attack-defense game. So there's always one team that's defending and one team that's, that's attacking. And if the team that's defending, then, you know hiding in a dark corner lying down and then just waiting the entire round if anyone comes through then you have the instant jump on them That's, it's not foolproof but it's pretty reliable in a public game like it will get you a kill do you think so because I think that the way that that game's meta has evolved in the very short amount of time that we've been playing it is fascinating because originally that was totally the case I'm just <laughs> making angrily at you with a pencil <laughs> I'll put this down but but since I'm, in the games that we were playing last night we started to see people faking out about where the, like you've got, if, if they're terrorists yeah. although they're never terrorists where the enemy team is holding the hostage I mean they, they would we suddenly, had around they yeah. just dispersed all over the map to make it really difficult for anybody to tell where the actual hostage mm. was because before you play as the attacking team you drive around in little car like remote control cars <laughs> yeah. it's just so much fun they <laughs> jump it's amazing they're like <laughs> you're talking about the drones right yeah it's not yeah. like you go go-karting uh, before they're, they're not full-size cars <laughs> <laughs> that would be conspicuous at best uh, yeah. tiny cars uh, that are just really uh, they almost look like little cylinders and they just mm. roll around you can jump upstairs and stuff and the enemies if they see you they can shoot those things but if your objective is to like, just find out where's the hostage being held or where's the, the critical bomb or whatever um, and I've dropped the critical bomb once or twice <laughs> there are multiple bombs this is the critical one <laughs> And yeah, we had one round where we were scouting it out, and we just like usually it's like the first person who sees some barbed wire or an enemy is like, okay, they're in this area, and even if they shoot me right now, we know it's roughly there, and we won't necessarily get eyes on the hostage and have it marked on our HUD, but we all know it's upstairs above the bar. Um, but we were having that with just everyone, like everyone said, ah, I saw someone, oh, let someone shoot, shot me, and then hmm. someone else shot the other guy, and they were just all over the place in different buildings, and we realised they'd like they'd in that setup phase 
probably done some setup and then just ran away from the hostage and just gone all over the map so that when we found them we didn't like there's a guy here but apparently that's not where they're set up and uh, that totally flummoxed us and so we never got to the hostage mm-hmm. and we lost then we tried to do it to them and it didn't work no. <laughs> <laughs> I did have some success of, of leaving everybody else around the hostage and going around and then backtracking around where the the people coming in were and killing them by shooting them in the back bravely um, <laughs> Yeah, I love those remote control cameras. They're really fast and nippy and fun to drive, and you can press space and they jump, which feels nice because you're in a remote control car. But they're great in terrorist hunt mode where you're playing against the AI because oh, yeah. the AI will shoot at them, but it takes them a little moment oh, yeah. before they shoot, and so you can use it to like tease them and kind of kick <laughs> them around a little bit. You can like troll them with this little remote control control car that makes this quite high pitched kind of when it drives and you just kind of sneak around a corner and go <laughs> until it come, until they see you and then you scoot away really quickly and then they come, come out I don't know I think I feel like I'm role playing the little robot from Star Wars The Force Awakens when I'm, <laughs> when I'm in that thing um, people will have seen that when, by the time this comes oh out oh god what a weird a different world it's going to be um, but it's I talked about it, I think, last episode, Radio yeah. Six Siege, and uh, I like asymmetric games, but it's interesting to me that it's a game about attacking and defending, where it's a game about... With, it's, a, it's a game that's designed systems around camping. You know, if you're a defender, yeah. then you're supposed to camp, you're supposed to entrench, you're supposed to put up walls and stuff like that. But as you say, the meta of it's really interesting because the walls are also destructible. So if there is a particular camping spot and people just learn at random, fire your shotgun through this wall mm. and you might hit a guy and kill him on the other side if he hasn't reinforced or if he's in that room or whatever. And so it's this interesting tug of war to and fro between learning how your enemy is actually playing that legitimizes camping as a tactic mm. in a way that other attack defense games even when camping was a totally valid and logical choice players fucking hated it because it still felt unfair in some way where it feels like Rainbow Six Siege is built systems that support it in a way that makes it part of the game more which is super rad it's a cool cool game from Ubisoft (laughs) (laughs) how do people feel about Gutav Gutav, as opposed to Mugzv and Gutav. Otherwise known as please. Grand Theft Auto V. I reviewed I like it. this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. It's it's weird because it's. I gave it a high score, and I think it deserves a high score because it's an extraordinary technical achievement. There's so much going on in it. Multiplayer is brilliant. Um, and I was hoping around before we recorded this, but whether or not it would make it into like my personal top three of the year. Because I really, really don't like the single player. Like, it has good set pieces. It has some, you know, good missions taken mm. objectively and so on. Yeah. But, like, the tone of that world and its storytelling has gotten to the point where when it's when it's actually good, or at least, like, adept in its execution of its ideas, it's like somebody who is a... who's super charismatic, but definitely an asshole. Like, there's nothing really nice about it. It's mm. sort of attractive because it's such a dickhead. But like, almost as if the game was a person, right? Like, it's sort of... There's an attractiveness to how much of a prick it is. GTA is negging you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like... Yeah, it is. And because it, it swings so... It swung so hard to the to that end of the spectrum, I think. Yeah. Right? And it's it was, as far away from 80 days as it's possible. <laughs> yeah, it, is, yeah, it is as far from that. And, and it's, GTA days. <laughs> but it's also as far from... It's also pretty far from GTA 4, weirdly. Yeah. 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 Like, GTA 4 oh, was like... Imagine a GTA written by Meg Giants. Wouldn't that be the best GTA ever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meg Giants like, should write all it's, the it's, yeah. it's, yeah. And it actually, if you want to talk about uh, Metal Gear and, and Kashima being famous for kind of letting films guide what he wants to do narratively, mm. like... Kojima at least has added, added this thick layer of Kojima to anything he's done. Right? There's a there's some real kind of weirdness in there, and you know, bullshit magical mechanics like we were talking about earlier, mm. and so on. Whereas um, Rockstar's narrative building is is technically adept in every in every sense, from the performances, the actors they get, the way they capture those performances, um, the music they use to accompany it, the art, and so on, design the cutscenes, and so on but soulless for me to such an extreme degree that like I really really reacted badly to it like oh yeah. it's interesting you say soulless because I, I think it's got a soul it's just not a nice one yeah maybe that's <laughs> better way of putting it like it's 
there's a but it's also there's also a tiresomeness to it now. Like what was once kind yeah. of really punky and rebellious about like the DMA designs, Grand Theft Auto games is now just stupid, right? It's like, oh, you know, there's a there's an internet in it, but it's called twat. Yeah, <laughs> right. So like, hey, so that's GTA humor. Yeah, in that the show. A is an at sign. Yeah, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Of course, because <laughs> it's like on the internet you have at signs, but that sounds like yeah. an at. If you've got two, yeah. The thing is that that's funny when you see it as a texture in yeah. a game, like, and it's just a texture. But now it has to be incorporated into a whole piece of world building. This and is the thing. It's like, oh, like okay. back when GTA didn't really have a story and you were a mute protagonist and people shouted at you and you yeah. went and had fun, having those sort of visual gags on the environment just took what would have just been backdrops and made them into part of the experience. And that was cool. Mm. Whereas now the whole thing is this rich cinematic thing. And so it's, it's a story about act- just twats, but <laughs> like, but with those visual gags in the background. It's discordant and crap and it, it, I think it is, like, I think that's back to the drawing board bad about that game. But, like, the last time I seriously played, spent some time on GTA Online wasn't doing the heists and stuff, although they're brilliant. It was a bunch of us met up on our bikes and most bikes and cars. We found a clothes shop. We all bought, started, got changed, bought and got changed into the most garish beach outfits we could put together with, like, neon plastic shades and beach shorts and, like, um, massive flip-flops and stuff. And then we all got on a seaplane, sat on the struts, and just glided down the beach, skimming <laughs> other players as a as a giant big pl- like seaplane full of pudgy, pasty men <laughs> in shit shorts and flip flops. And then we all fell into the sea at once, Aww. and it was beautiful. It's like no <laughs> other game can you do that. No other game can you make your own fun the most cliche as that is in, in precisely that way, like. Fuck it, we're just gonna we're gonna fuck around. We made a game where you would chase each other around the roller coaster. One of you would sit on the roller coaster and someone else would run ahead of them naked. And you have to try and get around the entire roller coaster course before the person in the car runs you over. Like, there's there's such depth and brilliance to the world they made for that game. Um the the fact that I think they squandered it on that single player is is um is we, almost moot. It's still brilliant. We used to do these things in GTA 4. Mm. Yeah, um, we had GTA, well GTA 5's multiplayer is much more robust in that there's a persistent online mode where you can much more easily play with other players, whereas GTA 4 was games for Windows Live to fuck yeah. um, and barely e- ever worked even when we were just trying to get three or four people in the same office into a game together. But when it did, it was that sort of stuff. It was make your own games with helicopters and mopeds and that stuff was great but the, the reason I love GTA 5 is the city it's just the world they've created and I think the single player is in my eyes better than GTA 4's in terms of mission design and the fun you can have with the house did you go along and the particular set pieces um, yeah, it's kind of mechanically iterated. I think it's mechanically yeah, iterated. Yeah. I, I think a lot of tonal things aren't as. Uh, not to my taste. I, I felt like GTA 4 was like. My guy was sort of uh, like amoral but not an active jerk for most of it, as far as I played. And then the cast was full of jerks. It was like jerks and idiots, like pathetic idiots for utter fucking. <laughs> and those are the two characters. And then GTA 5 were like, I'm the utter fucking in at least two of the three characters. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and also everyone else is an utter fucking. And it's just so fucking depressing. Oh, I hated yeah. it. Every That's the most yeah, C words much... we've ever used in a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I find that much less though, because like, I know that Nico is at times, in certain cutscenes, in certain situations, a sympathetic character, but I lose all sympathy with him because he does what the is <laughs> asking to. And it's just yeah. a game about doing jobs for Yeah, <laughs> the mechanics. <laughs> and it's, it's not a Christmas <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same with Red Dead Redemption which is why I gave up on that game eventually as well it's so so frustrating to just do those random jobs whereas GTA 5 although you know the characters that you're playing as are less sympathetic the people you're doing the jobs for and the actual jobs you're doing I didn't find that as egregious like most it's of the time self, it? you uh, it, it, it does, it for no reason it still reaches that fever pitch of doing jobs for, for people who are screwing you over and knowing you're screwing you over and the fact that you've killed millions of people up until this point doesn't yeah. give you pause to it's say. Also, like, it's, it's, it's stuff like Nico. It's got the torture sequence. Yeah, like I don't think you can maybe. Yeah. Does, I think, I think like, the, the torture sequence you could possibly excuse as Rockstar making some kind of meta commentary on the way that violence is used in those games and scandalizes people, despite the fact that it's impersonal a lot of the time. And then uh, finally, they presented a scene that would really 
really legitimise the, the the kind of criticisms of being kind of violent porn. Do you is not that, think is that excuse for it? I know. <laughs> no, I, I, well, no, I don't think it's a reason for it. <laughs> it seems like it always makes it worse. <laughs> my, like my, I gave up on GTA Four's missions at the point where you completely destroyed your cousin's life and when he was in tears yeah. you mocked him for it. Like, that didn't seem like a sympathetic character anymore. And I'd kind of given up on caring before that when in, like, the sixth mission your job is to get protection money from a bunch of businesses for some Russian asshole yeah, yeah. and you just basically beat the crap out of and terrorise a mm. bunch of recent immigrants who are poor and new to the country. And it's like... That's the, you know, at that point, anything that GTA 4 is seeming to try to say about Nico Bellic just falls away. And so GTA 5's fantasy of just, this is you know, borderline Ocean's Eleven, but without so much of a sense of fun, like we're just going to do bank heists because we want to be rich, that is much better to me than picking on the, the poor and the suffering. But... Before <laughs> this movie goes on forever. Yeah. The reason I was going to say I really like GTA V is just the city. I really like just walking around that world. And literally just walking around, especially now it's got first-person mode on PC. Mm. And I spend much more of my time taking pictures with the crappily satirical Instagram clone <laughs> on my in-game phone. Insta-balls or something. It's <laughs> yeah. In- oh, insta Yeah, that's a good joke. <laughs> I spent, <laughs> spent much more time taking photos of sunset and oh. re- strange animations in parks that are just created for that one area of the world or interesting looking streets. Yeah. It is a wonderfully convincing city to explore, mm. much more so than any other game. And, you know, I kind of value GTA for its systems to a certain extent as well because although its in game internet is called Twat. <laughs> there is a very similitude to that world, which I value. Like, like compare GTA to something like MGS Five. GTA seems to have almost a surprising lack of systems. Like, it doesn't have any kind of of the resources that you're normally collecting in a equivalent Ubisoft game. It doesn't have yeah. The AI the kind of, is non-existent, really. Like, you know, you don't feel like you're cleaning a map of icons. You don't feel uh, like there's two hundred i um, two hundred collectibles to pick up at every corner. It doesn't feel like you mm. there's six different resources that each have a different thing, and that you're those are sub goals and every mission you perform is like no, there's money which you get for completing missions. And then everything else is just in service and building this world, whether it's the internet, whether it's the TV shows you can watch in your apartment, whether it's the um, uh, sports that you can go play, the tennis game, the golf game, that sort of stuff. None of these things are particularly good in and of themselves, but they're, they build a world which I find believable and extremely satisfying to just walk around Hmm. In a way that, even though I don't want to play their their quite shitty tennis game, I wouldn't enjoy walking around that world as much if I didn't know that the tennis game was possible. <laughs> That's the weird. Yeah, part. I think they should absolutely be applauded for the crazy depth and and breadth of that thing. I just yeah, I don't like any of the characters in it. Yeah. yeah, I don't like the characters, yeah, but right. I, I don't know that that's necessarily an impediment to enjoying the game. No, I, I, I think so. I think even though I played it in two thousand fourteen on. on presumably on a console, I can't mm. remember which, but um, I, uh, it gave me one of the, my favourite moments of that year, which is, and, and as part of the narrative, as part of the single player as well, which was a uh, psychedelic skydiving scene. Oh, yeah, I remember, yeah. Um, and it's just you skydiving, and it's trippy, and there's music playing. And yet, I think maybe because of the contrast between that and where it takes place within the narrative and it's kind of a cathartic moment for the character who's been an asshole up until now, maybe he realises at this point he should be slightly less of an asshole. Um, Give or take. Um, It's such a moment of catharsis uh, and it's in so such great contrast to the rest of the, the the tone of the rest of the game but I found it extremely kind of be- beautiful really which is weird single tear <laughs> down <laughs> your face as you watch a middle aged man continue to have a middle aged crisis <laughs> yes on drugs yeah yeah but to what extent the games owe you nice characters 
Yeah. It's not about nice characters, it's about good characters, and I think that's the mm-hmm. difference. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not the people in GTA... The problem with GTA 5, not to go make the last forever, but the problem with GTA 5 isn't that the characters are bad people. It's that everybody is... A pop- well, only the main characters are given any kind of depth, mm-hmm. and they're given the kind of like self-indulgent depth of being an asshole, which is kind of the mark of really kind of tiresome anti-hero writing to me. Like, that kind of... Well, they've got all these issues, so therefore it's justified that they're going through all this shit. And the characters that Michael particularly is surrounded by are all incredibly vapid, very immediate stereotypes mm-hmm. and justify his crisis. You know, like, the notion is his midlife crisis isn't just a fucking psychotic break by a man who really has it good and shouldn't maybe should come the fuck down. And, and the way his, his wife is written, his daughter, his son is written, his, his wife's yoga instructor is written, all those characters are, present, are presented in the... probably the first stereotype you'd go to for each of those characters in order to justify the behaviour of the twat at the centre of it. Well, you know why yeah, they're all terrible assholes? It's because there was such a strong pushback to Nico not being a terrible arsehole and that being dissonant and not only that but Fuck. also also now bringing to drink <laughs> <laughs> no. I didn't say the entire phrase <laughs> but also <laughs> but also the fact that um, uh, the game you know there were a lot of complaints when GTA 4 came out about it just not being the kind of fun thrill ride it didn't have a jetpack yeah, right. in it you know it wasn't zany enough and, and I think that's that's what Rockstar are doing with that torture scene is uh, saying yeah. well okay no, <laughs> you know, like, no it's like saying well, oh you want pure carnage you want oh you want just complete you know just amoral wish fulfillment well here's what that looks like you know it's, and may, it's, maybe you shouldn't you don't get to absolve responsibility for something that you're doing in the game <laughs> no no I'm not saying this really comes off well uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I can kind of understand the the point that they're making there's, the, there's a distinction I think between I hated it but <laughs> the self absorption of the characters to which you're referring and its depiction of all other characters suggesting a certain self absorption of the people so, making it yeah. and I don't think that's their intent I don't, well, or at least I don't think I don't think the people making it are self absorbed I think perhaps they're trying to create a world which reflects the world view like it's seen through the lens of the characters that are at the core of it. But it doesn't work. Like the the self absorption of the three main characters mm. should make them a figures of ridicule that the game should then undercut. Like yeah. you should be invested in their idiocy and and awfulness and then the world should prove them wrong. And yet the way it depicts all women <laughs> Yeah. It suggests that it's trying to prove them right. Like, the the writers of it seem to be bending the world to the whims of its characters. It's, it's tricky when you have three characters instead of one, in a way that you're not occupying one perspective, and therefore it's not a lens then, it's kind of this other mm. thing. But I do think it is supposed to be a game about fucked up masculinity. Like, masculinity at, at its extremes... But they're not critical of masculinity. But they're, 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 they're not... They're, no, but they're, they're also have this conflict where it also has to be a power trip for the player. Mm. So... What they do on the one hand is create these kind of disgusting characters who are obviously disgusting, but then they have to, um, you know, reinforce, give you pleasure as a player and give you awesome set pieces to do and make you an action hero. And those two things don't go together well if you're actually trying to say anything about, you know, that subject. And it's just savage about femininity, whether it, you know, in all the cases, whether it's Michael's family or whether it's... Is it Franklin's aunt that yeah. he stays with mm-hmm. and her uh, yeah. group of friends? Or, or Trevor's every... introduction in its entirety. Yeah. Which, which explicitly includes one of the very few really good female characters that Grand Theft Game has had. Because yeah. his introduction includes lots of characters from Lost and Damned, which was probably the closest to Grand Theft Auto Game has been to being about good people. And, yeah. Oh, no, it's just... the Battle of the Gay Tony. Oh, yeah. Well, Battle of the Gay it's in the same era, mm-hmm. right? Um, blah. We should move on. Yeah. yeah. And with that blah, we should move on to Blablon. <laughs> Blablon. Bloodborne, which <laughs> is the, uh, the again, we're not allowed to talk about. We're not allowed to talk about it, so we definitely won't talk about it at all, will we, Tom? And except that it's the best game of the year. <laughs> um, I haven't really played, and, and I, I really loved what I played, but I just haven't been able to play enough of it. Yeah, I, I went back um, and it. So I, I beat it all, uh, and then I restarted on New Game Plus to do the expansion stuff. Um, that just merely reconfirmed the fact that it is in fact the best game of the year and it's fucking unbelievably good I died to the first enemy six times and then gave up <laughs> <laughs> that's Aww. really good fuck that game that's <laughs> uh, so good I don't that's really good I take it all yeah it's, it's um, yeah. 
Yeah, no, but it, do, it does need some podcastry, so I won't get into it now. Like, why it's maybe, maybe we did promise well. once upon a time <laughs> we to did. do a club one podcast. But now is not the time. No, no, exactly. Time. Like, uh, I'm not going to insert that second podcast into this already <laughs> even burgeoning podcast that we've created. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk briefly about the Beginner's Guide, which I think is, uh, again, one of the small games of the year that knows exactly what it is, very fine game, which is critical about uh, the, the way that games are absorbed by their audience. And it's really interesting. I think it's such a, a, a perfect companion to Dr. Langerskov uh, and the Whirlwind Tiger, Tiger, Tiger and the, the Terrible Ter- 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 Ghost Emeralds and Whirlwind Heist. That's the one. <laughs> Both of which live, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Both of which were made by former uh, makers of the Stanley Parable. But whereas the Beginner's Guide is kind of about uh, the impossibility of knowing exactly what the, an author's intention are, uh, Dr. Langerskov is obviously about the impossibility of really knowing what a player is ever going to do and desperately trying to account for that. <coughs> and yet, you know, Dr. Langerskov does a really good job of accounting for everything that the player might want to do. <laughs> and I, I, it's, it's a really interesting kind of battle of theses between those two games, almost. I don't... It's interesting just to read the reactions of Beginner's Guide, which is kind of about... Um, uh, it's a, it's a, narr- a fictional narrative uh, delivered as though it were a kind of pseudo-documentary from the perspective of a fan of a particular maker's games, and he's showing you these people's games in modified versions of them so that he can take you through them as the player, um, like like a developer's commentary. And um, uh, that that kind of allows for him to not only explain the games and show you interesting things to do with games, but also expose his own weaknesses and his inability to understand them properly and maybe the conflict between him and the developer of the games. And that plays out in a really kind of interesting way. I think it's probably one of the most uh, profound games of the year in terms of it describing the, the parameters of authorial intent and reception of uh, you know any kind of ideas. And you know the you know death of the author, the validity of the audience's perspective, irrespective of the original design, all these kind of massive ideas, and it's just so eloquent and kind of cool. I had problems with it as well, but I couldn't really talk the about only, it. That's calling. The only downside for me was that um, I actually believed it was real when it started. So it's, <laughs> it's Davy Reedon, the creator of Stanley Parable, who is uh, you know. Um, introduced himself as Davy Reedon, um, and he talks over a Counter Strike map. I think Counter Strike One rather than Counter Strike Source. Um, as you're walking around it, made by this esoteric creator, and for like a, the first few levels going through this, I thought this is like one of the coolest works of games journalism I've ever seen. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's made a sort of you know he's used game making to develop a way of exploring one particular creator's work, and I had no context for it at all. It was just a thing that just arrived in my Steam account um, mm. uh, as an early test version, and so I had no idea what to make of it at all. I didn't have any context for whether it was a you know work of fiction or not, and so for a while I just thought it was true. And uh, I ended up enjoying it as a work of fiction, but for the time that I thought it was a work of fact, I thought, God, this is awesome. So, <laughs> of course, you should, you should explore other people's work like this, like making a game out of it and talking, doing an interactive narrative on it where, you know, we have developers' commentary from the developers of the games, but we've never had developers' commentary from someone else. We've mm-hmm. had a critic's yeah. commentary on developers' work. No, I think it's a really good example of journalism <laughs> that isn't journalism, but should be journalism. And I think, actually... the game journalism. The, 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 <laughs> the way that the game uh, problematises that is itself a kind of problem with the game yeah it's really, it's really interesting <laughs> oh <there>. Christ <laughs> <laughs> I was struck by uh, it I've reached peak Quaden sorry peak Quaden Crowbar peak <laughs> Wayne Drunken is actually a part of it yeah um, it made me it did make me think more about the, the destructiveness of criticism like uh, the fact that you, so there, there are these prototypes that no one you can't possibly ever independently encounter yourself you can't go and download those rooms, those games that uh, exist in the beginner's guide separately. You can never form your own interpretation. You'll force through this guy's mm-hmm. final interpretation in a way that actually destroys any potential for other um, interpretations of those rooms and those works. Oh, there's some. Oh, there's a, one particular detail in the game which I can't I can't explain, but it, it it's, it's a brilliant uh, twist moment that's never actually kind of overtly highlighted by the narration or the context of the game. Mm. And but it, if you spot it and it kind of registers as something that's in contradiction with what you've learnt previously, and it just unlocks the entire thing. 
That's <laughs> such a vague explanation of something <laughs> that sounds great. Enjoy that. <laughs> Enjoy that. Is that has anyone done a let's play of the beginners? <laughs> <laughs> I asked. I asked because that sounds like it That's would be an amazing disaster. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. I don't know. I don't know. I just really, really want to see PewDiePie or somebody like hoot <laughs> over that. I think that would that would explain a lot to me. Uh, another indie game uh, that I really didn't like, but you really did, Tom. Magic Circle. Yeah, I wanted to include this one because um, uh, I feel like a lot of people who would really love it maybe didn't play it. I feel like it, it, I was expecting it to be a big deal. I thought it would be like not quite Stanley Parable level, but sort of up there with it because it's very funny. It's um, uh, it's very grimace. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've been spoiled by being able to grimace. <laughs> <laughs> On the audio, it's always like seen it. Marsh's grimace there. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, you know, it's very much a similar space. It's a, it's about games. It's about the production of games, and it's about player choice and that kind of stuff. But the thing that I think is really valuable about it that you shouldn't miss if you're into the same kind of things I am is that it's a extraordinarily flexible playground for messing around with these um, incredible tools that it gives you. It's a game about. Uh, you're in an unfinished game there's AI creatures running around and any of them you can stop them and edit them and change their behaviour so you get to edit their AI and you get to edit who they're allied with but you also get to edit really fundamental stuff like how they can move do they walk across the ground or can they fly Um, how do they attack are they a melee creature or do they have a long range attack or do they have a tractor beam or do they take over the mind of what they're attacking or do they copy their thoughts to all the other creatures of the same type and you can mix and match all of these things and combine them in really creative ways. And I think it's only flaw as a puzzle game is um, that it's uh, it's so open ended that there are like you know seventeen solutions to every puzzle to the point where the first one you think of will probably work. <laughs> and so there are lots of things that you can just breeze through uh, very easily. And I found the first half of it is that kind of puzzly stuff, and then the second half is less puzzly. And I was hoping that the, the second half would be just puzzly again but harder because the first half I'd solved these puzzles like with flying colours I would solve them in like seven ways simultaneously by creating this extraordinary army of mad freaks all these properties you're adding to them are not just changing their behaviour but they visually change them too so if you say I want this dog to fly he sprouts helicopter blades and takes off into the air if you say I want this rock to uh, attack with melee he sprouts teeth and uh, the combinations of those things I found myself just plugging different behaviours into different creatures just to see like okay but how does the walker droid uh, have a tractor beam what does that look like or how does this um, turtle thing fly <laughs> what does that look like um, and then creating these absurd mixture armies of that programming them to sort of uh, have particular hatreds for different things in the world to coax them out to attack those things and then watching all the chaos unfold was so good I think the thing is that like, I remember playing it you know it takes a while until you actually get to start modifying behaviour and I was like as soon as that started happening I was like oh there's the game yeah. I feel like it's, it's, though it's, it's kind of um, is dampened by the framework around it and the kind of the things it's trying to say about games actually gets in the way of the amazing game that it probably should be if they yeah. just made a game about that it would have I, been... I found the narrative a strange thing because it's it's very story heavy but the story is very sort of caricatured it's these sort of the three or four archetypes of game developers where one of them is just so far in the Richard Garriott direction <laughs> and one of them is so far in the pro gamer direction and one of them is so far in the other one that they they really hammered up, you know, they go all out to just the absolute extreme of those personalities to the point where it feels like a comedy, except that then it has very emotionally charged moments or moments of sort of critical emotional impact. And that felt at odds with the, with the sort of tone of it. It would be so happy that I wasn't taking it seriously and then it was asking me to care about these things. I didn't really care that much. Uh, but luckily it has a, a, you know, a great game at its core. Hmm. And the final game on this massive list, Keep Talking. And nobody explodes. Which is the subtitle of every podcast we've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also the best co-op game, I think, probably released this year. In that yeah. It's a, a co-op game where one person is the bomb diffuser, and they are in a room with a bomb, and it's like a Fisher Price. It's, my, it's baby's first bomb. It's got, you know... <laughs> got big countdown clocks on it and big differently coloured wires and big red buttons that say push on it so it looks looks tactile and lovely it looks mm. bomb shit look well, it's designed to be a VR <laughs> game so you can actually yeah. rotate it in the VR version of the game presumably with your weird paddles, claw hands, paddles, hands, paddles, hands, hands, yeah. paddles whereas everyone else playing the game is I don't know what to call it they're not the diffuser they've got a bomb manual mm. and the bomb manual is just a PDF 
<laughs> and so it becomes a game about communication at that point. It's the bomb diffuser saying, okay, we've got wires, we've got a button that says push on it, we've got two batteries on the side, we've got a serial number, which is this, we, you know, and it communicates all this stuff that the, the bomb manual readers then have to look up and then communicate back and forth. And it plays lovely with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> but he's lovely. <laughs> For example, there's one Pop's of the quite bad. <laughs> <laughs> there's one of the one of Days the puzzles nice. is uh, it brings up six buttons. Each of the buttons has a word in it on it, and the word might be C, spelled S E E, or it might be C, spelled S E A, or it yeah. might be C. Just as in the letter C. <laughs> and so it encourages these moments of panic and these moments where you develop your own language. Like there's another one which is a, has a set of symbols. I think you talked about this in the podcast before. Where it's, oh, yeah. like, it's, it's the one that looks like a B, but you got bored halfway through. There's the curly pig's tail. There's the sort of... Sp- Bottom of the triangle. Spider. Bottom of the triangle. <laughs> yeah. It's the spider eye... Um, you, you develop your own language, and then you. The way I always play it is that after, uh, you, like, winner, person who doesn't explode stays on. Basically, <laughs> like you, you keep playing until you explode, and then you start back at the beginning, and everyone changes rounds. So real bomb to do that <laughs> yeah. <as> well. <laughs> and then you s- suddenly the person who's been looking at the manual now they have to come up with a word for. Describing these symbols, and there's this moment in your in your brain at that point where you suddenly go, "Oh, that's what they meant when they said <laughs> when they said bum over a triangle." <laughs> oh, or they don't do that; they just describe it in a completely different way without ever acknowledging that that's the symbol that you were looking at. You described it over as a bum over a triangle, but they they describe as a spider eye or whatever. <laughs> um, and it becomes a co-op game about communication, but it's also a co-op game about learning to play the game Hmm. you know it's best played if you've never looked at the manual before the point at which you start playing it's best played if you if you're the diffuser for the first time and you've never seen the manual that's yeah like pure ignorance is the best way to play that game (laughs) because that's when you get the kind of maximum reliance on communication um looking at the manual beforehand whether you're going to be the diffuser or the manualer (laughs) It spoils the experience somewhat because you want to be learning about it in real time. It's a game about mm-hmm. learning about new things in real time and then trying to communicate that to another person in real time. And it's a brilliant co-op game for that reason and it's a brilliant party game for that reason. And I think it's a game that you could play with people who don't play games. You know, yeah, uh, like just give them a PDF and say, and and it's all the puzzles are so perfectly pitched. Like they're not complicated puzzles in themselves each individual puzzle is quite simple actually and it's quite quick quite easily grokked mm. the, the challenge really is in the fact that you can't solve the puzzle you have to tell someone else how Can to you? solve the puzzle and then maybe you've got now six puzzles and a time limit of three minutes and mm. it's the crystal maze and Richard O'Brien's making fun of you <laughs> do you tell the game how many players you're going to have or no. do you have to no. the difficulty no, no but I mean, there's, there's a progression of diff- difficulty if you go through the game's challenges linearly so you can and is it just easier if you have more players because you have more people to... I don't no, know not really. it's easier if you've got more players it because it's, then the communication so. becomes a larger yeah. problem there I mean, because you're as the bomb diffuser <laughs> currently illustrated now you're, now you're <laughs> sorry 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 no <laughs> no but now as the diffuser you've got to talk to like five different mm. people if you've just got more people reading the manual so it doesn't become any easier it becomes a, a project management challenge yeah, you, it's the 720 no scope well, project but, management yeah the, the pro video I saw of it uh, which I talked about before was um, a guy with like four or five assistants and he they just had like a well old team so he knew exactly to say like Dave I need you to start mm. looking at the, mm. the symbol table and then uh, Lisa can you look up the next thing like three steps before he was needed to solve but that's problems. not really easier that's easier only because you've done the hard part of delegation yeah but I'm guessing because <laughs> that was like a, a high level thing he's um, you know the reason they're playing with that many people is because it would be harder with fewer people Mm, probably I mean there is a as you play through it the number of puzzles on each bomb increases so like to begin with it'll be three puzzles on a five minute bomb and then pretty quickly you're on six puzzles on a five minute bomb and then eight puzzles on a three minute bomb and that sort of stuff so being able to delegate at that point 
but it, it, it is, is important, but it, it, it kind of outsources the main challenge away from the puzzles to the communication so that even if you've got five people, when you're inexperienced, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Like it, it works really well in that hardcore mode. Less, I think, because the f- there's five people playing it or whatever, but just because they've played it so much that mm-hmm. they have their own language. They've developed all those processes for... I'm going to tell you what puzzle is coming up, and then you and I are going to solve this puzzle right now while that other person is looking up the manual, and then this thing is going to unlock at every minute. And so I'm going to give that to this other person. Like they've they've rehearsed that much, that you become a kind of expert in it. Nice, that's really brilliant. Seems like it has like a um, roots in disaster board games like Space Alert. Oh yeah, 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 where it's very much about juggling. Five plus or minus two, which is like the short short term memory limit for humans, which is how these things are designed, where you're always juggling that amount of things at the mm-hmm. same time, and you've normally got one command who has to lay it one out for it to work. Would you say also that it was a small game that knew exactly what it was? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 2015 review. That's <laughs> what we need. Little games that knew exactly what they were, and also Metal Gear, Pillars of Eternity, <laughs> <laughs> and GTA 5. The guy has no idea what it is. <laughs> yeah. Keep Talking has an extra advantage in that it's a little game that knows exactly what it is, and then made its title exactly what it is. <laughs> it is literally Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. Hmm. No one mentioned The Witcher 3 very much, or 4 out of 4. No. I thought about Fallout 4, but uh, like it's not one of my games. Yeah, I sort of get the impression I probably like it more than anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> I, I liked it, but it, as soon as I got to downtown Boston, it stopped working on my PC. Yeah. Um, so I'm having to stop until I upgrade my PC. And I haven't played it. And I think it's a bit shit. <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan. I haven't played The Witcher, so. I like what I played of it a lot, but I didn't like the combat. And that was your uh, sticking point as well, probably. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, The Witcher 3 has got stodgy things about it. Like, it looks fucking amazing, and the uh, the muddy, greasy, disgusting uh, horror stories it tells in that world are really fascinating Lovely as well. Moments of writing and, really, yeah, really, and nice really, quest design and sound points. Really well. fantastic quest design. Not only like the Bloody Baron quest has is been written about a lot, but even further on, there's a, an amazing quest for like a werewolf who you keep on killing and keeps coming back, and mm. it always just sounds strangled and frustrated with his lot every time you meet him. It's funny but also dark. And best writing in a AAA game, probably. Uh, Oh, well, yeah. Like, yeah, for this year, <laughs> I'd go with that. I'd go with that. I watched a video on YouTube of a scene in which Geralt, with two of his buddies, gets really drunk, dresses up in drag, and then drunk dials using a magical portal <laughs> device. <laughs> other other scholars around the world. Really? I haven't, yeah. I've not played I haven't done that. <laughs> trying, to, trying to call up. Uh, his sorcerer's friends to come around and party with them but he gets the incantation wrong because he's too drunk to remember it and he just gets like a portal view of like some random person somewhere in a university <laughs> elsewhere in the world who's really cross and he, he's just there in drag dressed as like Yennefer there's a <laughs> there's, uh, a, there's a drunk quest <laughs> there's a drunk quest in every Witcher game there's a, a really good girl gets two wasted quests in the Witcher 2 as well where he, yeah, he, up, he wakes up naked in the beach with a tattoo that's just permanently on your character because it's a third person game you're always seeing it there so uh, and you have, there's an enormous quest to like, get rid of it <laughs> so if you're still on that quest you're just stuck with it until you actually get the potions to get rid of it it starts with a, a drinking game you play with your two buddies uh, uh, I've never where you say I've never done such and such and if the other two people have done it then they have to drink Yeah, and so that's how it starts um, yeah the, there's loads of, the wish is great actually but uh but we don't like it that much. Well, so fuck that game. No, no, no. On the list. Marsh isn't ready to pencil. Why are we even talking about it? It should be my exact thing. It's just that yeah. for reasons I've been talking about on this podcast and the previous podcast, for now almost four years, mm. I never finished The Witcher 1. Yeah. And I just... Can't. <laughs> you don't want to do that much. It's the mass effect that never quite... Yeah, it is. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's, 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 which one's way worse than Mass Effect? Like, it has its defenders, yeah. but they're, they're really wrong. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not a good game. Literally trading card binders full of women. Yeah. 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 Oh, well. That's the entire list. So, we've now that we've list. all talked about all of the games um, for a lot of time, how much time? Lots of it? Just say One lots. One hour and 59 minutes. Jesus lots. Christ. Okay, I don't think we have questions. No. questions. No. Um, no. Tom, Game of the Year. Invisible Link. Tom Senior, Game of the Year. Her story. Wow. Marsh, Game of the Year. Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> you sound guilty about it. I love how painful you look. Yeah, I don't know. Graham, Game of the Year. 
Metal Gear Solid 5. Yeah. 80 days. Well, did not see Invis Blink, you did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> way. No, but that's an amazing session. <laughs> I was going to say Invis Blink as well, but then I didn't. And that's how awards work. <laughs> <laughs> but we all know that Bloodborne was the real winner. Yeah, yeah. that's very true, actually. But that's for another time. So, meaningless accolades dispensed. Two hour mark reached. <laughs> uh, we're not going to have time for questions this episode for obvious reasons. We're going to. We, we can fold them into the next episode when we get back in January. Next, January. Yeah. Do you know when that'll be? Have we decided when that'll be? No. Yeah. no. We'll decide when that'll be later. <laughs> if you'd like to send us a question for a future episode, you can do so by emailing questions at creightoncrowbar.com or tweeting us at creightoncrowbar or by leaving a question on the forum at creightoncrowbar.com forward slash forum. You can discuss this episode and future episodes. That's a nice one, Marty. That's bigger nice. than the others. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you can discuss this episode and future episodes. Future episodes? Can't discuss future episodes. No, don't do that. Used <laughs> by the dick. And our Discord channel, which is where people hang out now, uh, which you can find a link for with an invite thing. Discord is like a chat program. Find the link on the sidebar of the website on the right-hand side. If you would like to follow us as individuals on Twitter, I am at C Thurston, that's C-T-H-U-R-S-T-E-N. Graham, where the other around? I am at Gonis, G-O-N-N-A-S. Marty. I'm at Marsh Davis. I'm at PCG Ludo, which is L-U-D-O. I'm at Pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T. Mm. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh. Ah, ah, so that's that's a good noise. We don't have any drink left. No, no, no. fuck. <laughs>